Okay, hello. <clears throat> It's all good. Um, yep. All right. I guess I'll just get started then with the introduction. So welcome to the Math Triple Two One Two One Two One Seminar Part One today. Um, my name is Jay, and I'll be going through the first part of or the first half of this seminar today. And then I'll be handing it over to James, who will be taking on the second half of part one of the seminar today. And then at a later date, Steve and James will be doing part two. So as for my part, I will be going through pretty much an introduction to linear ODEs, and then also talk about um, whether, whether the solutions to a linear ODE is independent or not. And how the wrong and how the wrong skin can be used to help find that, and then strategies will include stuff like different methods we can use to solve linear ODEs, whether it's like separation of variables or reduction of order or making educated guesses for the particular solution. And then power series, we will look at general power series solutions to linear ODEs, as well as more specific, um, I guess tailored examples like Cauchy Euler equations as well as the Frobenius normal form. And then lastly we'll go through Bessel and Legendre's equations. Um, this, this won't be too in-depth, it will be pretty general. I'll just introduce you guys to what Bessel and, Bessel and Legendre's equations are, what the solutions are, some facts about them, and that'll pretty much be it. There will be no questions involving Bessel or Legendre's equations in this part. Okay. All right, I guess if that's the case, let's get started with um, the first slide. So the first thing to look at is to look at what is the definition of a linear differential operator. So we define this capital L as a linear differential operator, where if we apply this operator to some U, it will turn it into a expression where you have a coefficient. Let me get my pen out. Yep a coefficient multiplied by some order derivative of that u. So for example, this would be an example of how L would work. So L might turn our u into, let's say, 3 um, u double dash x plus, let's say, 4 x u dash x plus let's say 5u, okay? In this case, as you can see, um, our L, applying our L to our variable u, has given it a coefficient in front of double dash u plus some other coefficient in front, um, in front of single dash u and then plus some coefficient in front of just u itself, yeah? So it basically generates some linear combination of, the derivative of different orders of derivatives of u paired with some sort of coefficient at the front. Of course, this coefficient at the front can also be zero. Okay. And an other thing to note is that these, these coefficients here don't have to be constants, right? As you can see, the coefficients can depend on x, which is hence why, for example, this one here is dependent on x. Okay. Next, singular ODEs. So for most of this section, we'll be dealing with non-singular ODEs. But what, but what is a singular ODE? A singular ODE is 
where you have a situation where the leading coefficient may vanish across a certain domain that we're defining our x on, right? So for example, x u dash minus u equals zero, that is singular because this is our leading term. Oops. This is our leading term and this is our leading coefficient of x. And clearly between the boundary for x lying between zero and one, if x takes the value of zero, then this leading term here will vanish. And if that leading, and if that leading term here vanishes, then we consider this um, ODE singular, right? So as long as you have an ODE where the leading term can vanish anywhere on the domain of x, then it's called singular. Right? For the most part of this part, or like the most part of this, um, for the most part of my part, we'll be dealing with non-singular ODEs, which is when this isn't the case. So our leading term never vanishes for any value of x. Okay. All right, let's, look, let's, let's have a look at more definitions first. Homogeneous and inhomogeneous ODEs. So very simply, a homogeneous ODE is just an equation where you have a differential operator equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, it's homogeneous. An example would be u dash plus a u level dash plus u dash minus u equals zero. That's homogeneous. On the other hand, an inhomogeneous ODE is when you have a linear operator um, applied on u equal to some f that's non-zero. Okay, this f can be anything. It can be a function. It can be a constant. It doesn't matter. So, for example, u double dash plus u dash minus u equals the cos x would be an inhomogeneous ODE. So as you can see, these two things are very similar. In fact, they're exactly the same. The only difference is that the right-hand side is zero, the right-hand side is something, okay? All right, let's move on to our first example of the day. It's a non-exam question, and it's pretty much asking us to solve this, okay? So, Suppose we let u equal e to the power of rt. We haven't really gone through yet why this would be the case, but intuitively it makes sense because if, if you're gonna have some function take its second derivative plus some function take its first derivative minus some function equals to zero, we better have that this function, every time you differentiate it, is similar to before we differentiated it, right? Or else, in other words, you would get stuff that won't even um, be summable at the end, right? For example, if I chose, let's say, um, u equals to, I don't know, let's say we chose it to be um, ax, oops, ax to the power of five here, just randomly, then u double dash would be, well, u dash would be, u dash should be 5 ax to the power of 4, u double dash should be 20 ax to the power of 3, right? This wouldn't make sense because then you'd have some x cubed term, some x to the power of 4 term, some x to the power of 5 term. You can't even sum across them to begin with, so how are you ever going to reach 0? And so it makes sense to make a guess that is exponential because as you differentiate the exponential term, you get more exponential terms. And so it might make sense in the end to have some exponential term plus some exponential term minus an exponential term equals to zero, okay? So yep, like we said, we guessed u equal to e to the power of rt. And clearly u dash would be r e to the power of rt and u double dash would be r squared e to the power of rt. Then we plug this back into our initial question. Then we get u double dash, which is r squared e to the power of rt plus u dash, which is r e to the power of rt minus u, which is e to the power of rt equal to zero, okay? Now, e to the power of rt would never be zero because the exponential is never going to cross the x-axis. And so we can divide across by this without worrying. And we'd be left with r squared plus r minus one equal to zero. This here, we will later come back to it and this will be called the characteristic equation. Okay, I'm sure you guys have already known this from taking the course. But yeah, this is what we call the characteristic equation. Okay. Now we solve the characteristic equation and we come up with two solutions, R1 and R2. We got this solution here by simply applying quadratic formula. 
And so negative b plus minus square b squared minus 4ac over 2a, and we get this result on the right. Okay? So we have two values of r. We have the addition variant and the subtraction variant. Okay? And so our solution to our ODE, we have two of them. One of them would be when we have e to the power of r1t, and another one when we have e to the power of r2t. So for example, we could write it like this. Um, equal to e to the power of negative 1 uh, minus root 5 on 2t, and u2 equals to e negative 1 plus root 5 on 2t. Okay, where this is r1, let's say, and where this is r2. And then this will ultimately form a general homogeneous solution for us. So ultimately, a solution to this equation would be any linear combination of our two particular values here. Okay. So we have uh equals to some constant times u1 plus some constant times u2. Okay. This is because we can superimpose any of the solutions to form more solutions in the homogeneous case. Um, we'll come back later for a lemma that says, well, like that says that this is the case. But for now, um, hopefully, you guys already know that this would end up being the case. Okay. Now, let's also consider different possible cases, namely, what happens if there's a double root or if there are complex roots. So, in this question, our roots turned out to both be distinct and real which led us to this case where you have u1 equals e to the power of r1t and u2 equals e to the power of r2t. But what if our roots here were double roots or what if they were complex roots? So on the one hand, what if r1 equals to, let's say, I don't know, let's say 2, r2 also equals to 2. What happens then? Or what about if r1 equals to 1 minus i and r2 equals to 1 plus i? What happens then? So let me open up a new page and we can have a look at this situation. Um, actually, maybe let's change this up a bit. Maybe 1 minus and 1 plus i is not too interesting. I didn't just say it's delete. All right, let me open up a new page first. Okay. All right. So let's insert a black page here. Okay, there we go. And let's keep going. Orange pen. All right. So let's suppose we have the double root case. Okay. In the double root case, let's say, again, we have the example where R1 equals to R2 equals to, let's say, 2. Okay. Then... It wouldn't really make sense to then say, okay, well, we have one solution is e to the power of 2t, and the other solution is also e to the power of 2t. Because in the end, when we form our general solution, uh, it would be redundant to say a e to the power of 2t plus b e to the power of 2t. Because then we wouldn't need to write it as two separate terms. And furthermore, this wouldn't, I guess, span our space because our thing is a um, a second order differential equation up to u double dash and this only gives us one um, homogeneous solution so far okay so how can we find another one well it turns out it turns out that we can just place a t in front of the second solution okay so in the first case where you have or well, like the first special case so you have a double root to get two linearly independent solutions that do end up spanning your entire space, you can just plug in an extra t in front of your um, second solution. Right? So if you have u1 equals to e to the power of something t, u2 can just become t times e to the power of something t. Okay? Now, you can go ahead and verify that this actually does work. Right? So for example, if u2 equals to t e to the power of 2t, then u2 dash equals to by the... Um, by the by the product rule, you have this plus um, this, and then you double dash equals to um, 
this plus this and then plus um, this is right times left plus left times right so okay it's tripping me up a bit right left plus left right and far properly where is the eraser okay I don't know why I can't erase this uh, ignore this so you have plus 2t and then 2 e to the power of 2t Okay, which gives us 4 e to the power of 2t plus 4t e to the power of 2t. Okay? And so we end up with these values for u double dash, u dash, and u. And so then if we plug it back into our original equation of u double dash plus u dash minus u, you get u double dash plus u dash minus u equals to um, your 4e 2t plus 4t e to the power of 2t um, plus e to the power of 2t. Why does this not make sense? Um, okay, let me quickly erase this. Did I make a mistake here? u2, u2 dash e to the power of 2t plus 2t e to the power of 2t. Um, oh, wait, sorry. Hey, yeah, yeah, hey, what am I saying? Yep, so you, like, you could find out what u2 is, u2 dashes, and u2, and u2 double dashes, and for whatever equation this was solving, this would turn out to be zero, okay? The reason why this doesn't work here is because um, I realized that I just chucked in random double roots, not in particular these double roots, yeah? These, these roots here solve this equation here. This one would solve some other equation, okay? But essentially what I'm saying here is that if you have a double root for what for whatever equation you're trying to solve, by stopping on a t in front of the first root, you get a second a second linearly independent root, okay? Um, yeah, so I guess ignore this stuff here if this doesn't make sense to you. And the other special case is what if we have complex roots? So again, let's say if we had r1 equal to 1 minus i, r2 equals to 1 plus i. Then we could form u1 equal to e to the power of 1 minus i t, and u2 equals to e1 plus i t. This is absolutely valid, but typically we want these solutions here to not be like to not contain the imaginary constant i okay so how can we fix that well hopefully hopefully you guys can see that we can apply the wheel identity to turn stuff like e to the power of i t into cos t plus i sine t okay then by some then by the manipulation of the wheel the wheel identity we can make it such that these actual solutions no longer contain the imaginary constant i and it will eventually turn into some trig function. So for example, u1 will turn into um, e to the power of t cos t, and u2 will turn into e to the power of t uh, sine t. Okay. This extra e to, e to the power of t at the front is because we can first break this up like this. Okay. And so the e to the power of t stays at the front, and then the e to and then the e to negative i t and e to the power of i t turns into cos t and sine t respectively. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully you guys will recall this from your main course as well. But just as a um, refresher, this is how you deal with the different cases. If it's two distinct real roots, then obviously you can just go ahead and do it like normal. If you have a double root, to get a second linearly independent solution, you just slap on an extra factor of t. And if you have two complex roots, then you can turn them into trig functions of cos and sine. Okay. Next, let's have a look at initial value problems, or in other words, IVP. An initial value problem is when you have some ODE equal to um, F, let's say, on the domain A to B. And furthermore, you're given 
the initial values of um, u at these points. So for example, u a equals to some value v0, u dash a equals to some value v1, all the way to u to, uh, u m minus 1 a equals to v m minus 1. Okay. So one special thing to note here is that if your differential equation is mth order, you need up to the m minus m minus oneth um, initial condition. Okay. And if you do have this situation, then the combination of this first equation and these back, uh, uh, sorry and these initial conditions form an initial value problem. Okay. An example is if you have u dash plus u equals zero for u zero equals zero. Okay. So it's just essentially saying that if you have this um, for uh, x on let's say zero to some domain capital L, let's oh, use capital, capital L already. Say from zero to some other boundary, I'll just call it B. Okay, then having u zero equals zero, so u at the initial point zero equal to zero is enough to form an initial value problem. Reason being, our um, differential equation here is of order one, right? Because it's the first derivative. And so all we need is some condition on the zeroth order of u, okay? Then we have an uh, initial value problem, okay? And if you actually went ahead to solve this, you will get that u equals e to negative, equals e to the power of negative x. And the main point here is that we have a unique solution, right? Because recall from before, without the initial condition, the best you could do was come up with some sort of form for the homogeneous solution. But we didn't know what a and we didn't know what b was. But now, now that we're given an initial value problem, we no longer have like an A or B at the front. We just have the exact particular unique solution, e to the power of negative x. Okay. So that's so this here is exactly what I said just then. Um, these few slides, right? If we have the situation as we described before, then we will always have a unique solution. Okay. Furthermore, theorem two states that the homogeneous equation solution will always be some sort of linear combination of all of the solutions that we derived, right? Which is what we did back here. Okay. Once we figured out two linearly independent solutions, that's enough to span our space because we only have a second order equation here. So all we need is two linearly independent equation, or two linear, two linearly independent solutions. And once we can span the entire space our general solution will just be a linear combination of these um, homogeneous solutions, okay? It's exactly what this chunk here is talking about, right? So as long as we have some mth order ODE and we can find m linearly independent solutions, that will span the entire space. And so then we can have a general homogeneous solution that is just a linear combination of all of those linearly independent solutions, okay? It's quite, um, I guess, alike to linear algebra if you have taken 2601 before. Okay. All right, let's further extend the example we're going through before, but now adding on initial conditions. Firstly, we can identify that this is indeed an IVP. Why is that? Because our initial equation here, uh, like our problem here, is of the second order. And we're given um, initial conditions. Con we're given initial conditions. Um, I guess regarding the zeroth and the first order here, right? And remember, the theorem said that if we have a mth order ODE, all we need are initial conditions up to the m m minus oneth order. In this case, two minus one is one. So we have all the initial conditions that we need in order for this problem to be considered an IVP. So from the theorem above, we should also expect that through working out this question, we should come down to a unique solution where there's no longer any A's or B's. It will just be a single unique solution, okay? So recall previously um, from our working out before, we got to UH equals to AE to the power of R1T plus BE to the power of R2T, where R1 and R2 were some um, quadratic solution root. Right? So for example, I remember, R1 was 
1 minus root 5 on 2, R2 was 1 plus root 5 on 2. For, simpl for simplicity's sake, I will just leave them as R1, R2 here. Okay. Now, let's make use of our two initial conditions that we were given in this question. U at 0 is equal to 0. Okay. If we plug 0 into our um, homogeneous solution here, you would get A e to the power of 0 plus B e to the power of 0. So just A plus B equals 0. And if we plug this condition in, so U dash 0 equals to 2, we will get this condition here. Right? If we differentiate this, you will get um, R1A e to the power of R1T plus R2B e to the power of R2T. Right? So when you plug 0 in, this term will just become 1. This term will just become 1. So you're left with R1A plus R2B equals to 2. So from this condition, we derive that B equals to negative A. And so if we plug B equals negative A into here, you would get this. Right? Because you would have R1A minus, um, minus R2B, R2A equals to 2. Then you, then you can just factorize out your a, then you get r1 minus r2. Yeah. Okay, so if that's the case, we can solve for a. a will just become 2 over r1 minus r2. Then since b is the negative of a, b will just be 2 over r2 minus r1. And thus we end up with this solution here. And now, as you can see, there are no more undetermined constants, right? We don't have a free parameter a or b anymore. This here, although r1 and r2 is here, it's an actual number. Because remember, r1 and r2 are actual numbers. Yeah. r1 and r2 take on an actual value. And so this coefficient here is an actual value. It's 2 over some actual value. e to the power of r1t plus 2 over some actual value, e to the power of r2t. So we now have a unique solution, okay? which, is what we expect, which is what we expected in the first place. All right, let's move on to looking at linear independence. So just a definition of what linear independence is. U1 to UM are functions on the interval I um, in the real space. And we say that U1 to UM are linearly independent if you construct a linear combination of these U's equal to zero, and it forces all of these A1s to AMs to so the coefficients of these u's to be zero, okay? So in other words, it's saying, if you form this linear combination of u's equal to zero, the only possible solution to this must be that these a's in the front are all zeros, okay? If that is the case, then we have a set of linearly independent functions. If that is not the case, then we have a set of linearly dependent functions, okay? A bit more of an of an intuition as to why. Suppose that there was some other way you could form this linear combination such that your a's don't have to be zeros. Then let's just take the case that you have u1, u2, u3. Let's say you could pick um, I don't know three u1 plus uh, one u2 plus um, negative two u3 equal to zero. Right. So we are able to pick an a1, a2, and a3 that are not zero, such that this still equals to zero. Then this set u1, u2, u3 are linearly dependent. Reason being, I can rewrite u3 dependent on u1 and u2. So for example, I can do this. Right. Then clearly, u3 can be written dependent on u1 and u2, or vice versa, you can write u1 dependent on u2 and u3, you can write u2 dependent on u1 and u3. But the main, I guess, takeaway from this is that u1, u2, and u3 are linearly dependent because you can write one of them as the sum of the others. Okay? Okay. Now, we might be wondering then, how can we determine whether a solution to a linear ODE is linearly independent or dependent? To do that, we must first introduce the wrong scheme. So the definition of the wrong skin is if you have the functions u1 to um, it is 
it is the m by m determinant of this. Okay. This might be a bit arbitrary to understand. So let's, so let's look at an actual example. If you have a three by three run skin, that means you have u1 up to u3. Okay, I don't know why this is still n. This should be up to only three. And it, and it would just be the and it would just be the determinant of a matrix where your first row is just u1, u2, u3. Your second row is the first derivative of u1, u2, and u3. Your third row is the derivative of u1 dash, u2 dash, and u3 dash. And it keeps going. Right? So for, so for a 3 by 3, it stops here. But for example, a 4 by 4, you would expect it to keep going up until u1 um, dash dash dash, u2 dash dash dash, u3 dash dash dash, and u4 dash dash dash. Okay, that's one too many dash here. It should just be three dashes. So u3 dash 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 and u4. Okay. Okay. This would be for a for a four by four um, matrix. Or for a four by four run scheme. Okay. Four by four. Wrong scheme. Okay, so the pattern is simply it's a it's it's a determinant of a matrix where each row is just u one u two u three all the way to u m. Then the row every every successive row is a is every successive row is a derivative of the row above. Okay. All right. So we have a theorem here that helps us determine whether something is linearly independent or not. Put it simply, um, if u1 to um are the solutions to a non-singular homogeneous m order ODE, then if the run skin is zero, um, then the solutions will be linearly dependent. And if the run skin is not zero, then the solutions will be linearly independent. Okay. So if you ever want to check if whether the solutions to a homogeneous equation is um, independent or not, we just we just have to check if the run skin is equal to zero or not. Some extra lemmas for linear independence and the run skin. Lemma one: If u one to u m are linearly dependent, then the run skin is equal to zero. Okay. So note that here we have nothing talking about a linear differential operator. Right. It's simply if you have some set of functions you want to u m. They don't even have to be solutions to a ODE. As long as they are linearly dependent, then their run skin will always equal to zero. Okay? So it's kind of like kind of like this going this way. But we don't even need the fact that U1 to UM are solutions to a um, ODE. Okay. A lemma two would be that if U1 to UM are solutions to the ODE. Um, this ODE here. Um, then the run skin will satisfy this result. Okay. So this time we do require that your u1 to ums are solutions to a like to a particular ODE. But if that is the case, then we have that am w dash plus am minus one w equals zero, which is basically the leading coefficient times double um, plus times w dash plus the second coefficient times w equals zero. These lemmas will come into use in a question soon. So let's have let's have a look at an example. Show that the homogeneous solutions to the following linear ODE are linearly independent. So you have the ODE y double dash plus two y plus four equals to zero. So firstly, we need to actually solve the ODE. And once we actually solve the ODE, we will get in this case two. Solutions, because we have a second order differential equation. And then from these two solutions, we can then calculate its front skin and determine whether it's zero or non-zero, and then finally deduce whether it's linearly independent or not dependent. Okay. So let's start off by finding the solutions. The characteristic equation will just be r squared plus 2r plus 4. So we brought up cat we so I brought up I brought up the 
characteristic equation earlier. And essentially, it's the same thing here. Right? A quick way to go from the actual question to the characteristic equation would be to just map down, um, I guess, the order of the derivative. Right? So for example, this is y double dash, so you have r squared. This is 2 times y, no dash, so it's just r. And then finally, plus the constant 4. Okay? Okay. So next, the characteristic, yeah, so this is the characteristic equation we, uh, we attain. Then solving this characteristic equation, we get these two solutions. We get negative 1 plus minus i times root 3. Okay? And then based off what we did earlier, we can get um, our homogeneous solutions, which will be this here. Um, I believe I am missing some E terms at the front. Okay, sorry, I'll fix this in the slides a bit later, but at the moment, let's just move on. So let's assume that U1 ends up being just cos square root T, uh, square root 3 of T, and U2 equals to sine square root 3 of T. All right. Um, yeah, so there's a slight error here. U1 should actually be e to the power of negative t cos square root 3 of t. And U2 should be e of negative t sine of square root 3 of t. Okay? Because this is the negative 1 here. And you would have started off with this. This and this. Okay? And so there should, have, there should have been an extra factor of um, e to the power of negative t at the front. Okay, I must have dropped that off by accident. Okay, but moving on, let's say we now compute the run skin for those values of u and u2. Again, the run skin will just turn out to be the determinant of u1, u2, u1 dash, u2 dash. And so cos root 3t, sine root 3t. We, dif we differentiate cos root 3t, we get negative root 3 sine root 3t. We differentiate sine root 3t, we get root 3 cos root 3t. Okay? And so, what is the run skin then? That would just be the determinant, so it will be the... Um, sorry about what happened earlier, not quite sure what happened, but, um, I think my stream dropped out. I should be back now. Um, let me just make sure that the stream is working again first. seems to be but all right um let's keep going so yep so the run skin here will turn out to be where is my cursor okay yep so ultimately the run skin will turn out to be this plus this because we have this times this minus minus this times this, okay? This ultimately equals to root 3 because the cos squared and the sine squared just equals to 1. And this is non-zero, right? So root 3 is not equal to 0. And so the ODE does indeed have a linearly independent homogeneous solution, okay? So that means these two solutions here, cos root 3t and sine root 3t, are indeed linearly independent, okay? Let's move, let's move on to example 3. So prove that if u1 and u2 are solutions of a second order homogeneous differential equation, so a2 u double dash plus a1 u dash plus a0 u equals 0, then the run skin must satisfy a2 double dash, uh, a2 w dash plus
us a1w equals 0. So essentially, it's asking us to prove this lemma here um, for the case where um, it's just second order. Okay. All right. Let's start off by looking at that. So part B. Firstly, note that since u1 and u2 are solutions to the ODE, we can rewrite um, equation 1 and equation 2. Right? So if we assume that u1 and u2 are solutions of the second order ODE, then if we plug in u1, it should equal 0. If we plug in u2, it should, okay, it should also equal to 0. Okay? And that's what we get these two equations from. Okay? Next, let's compute w and w dash. So w would just be the determinant of, again, in the first row, u1, u2, in the successive row, u1 dash, u2 dash. And that would give us u1, u2 dash minus u2, u1 dash. Okay. Next, let's compute w dash. Right? The reason why we're computing w and w dash is because we're trying to prove this result. Right? We're trying to prove that um, a2 w dash um, plus, is it plus or minus? Plus, yeah. Plus a1 w equal to 0. So to do that, we need to know what w dash looks like, and we need to know what w looks like. Okay? So w dash would just be applying product rule. We would get u2 dash u1 dash plus u1 u2 double dash minus u1 dash u2 dash minus u2 u1 double dash. Okay? And obviously this here and this here would cancel. So we're just really left with u1 u2 double dash minus u2 u1 double dash. Okay. Now moving on, let's actually just go ahead and um, try compute what this a two w dash plus a one w is. So that'd be equal to a two times um, this expression from before plus a one times this expression from before. Okay. Then. Um, of course, again, firstly, this and this cancels out. If you then expand and then collect the terms for u1 and collect the terms for a2, we then get this line here. Okay. So if you think about it, a2 times this will give you, um, I'll just write it out, a2, u1, u2 double dash, so this and this. And then this times this will give you negative a2, u2, u1 double dash. Then here you have this times this, which will give you a1, u1, u2 dash, minus this times this. So a1, u2, u1 dash. Okay. And now if you factorize out the u1 from the u1 term, so factorize u1 out of here, and factorize u1 out of here, you'll get this. And if you factorize out u2 out of here, and u2 out of here, then you'll get this. Okay. But note that this stuff in the brackets is quite similar to this stuff here, except it's missing one term. Okay. So for example, here you have a2 u2 double dash plus a1 u2 dash. All it's missing would be the a0 u2 term. Okay. So we can make use of this fact here. Um, this, to get that this, must actually be equal to this. Right? Just move this term to the right. Same thing for this one here. Okay. And so ultimately, we'd be left with negative a0 u1 u2 plus, because of the negative negative, a0 u1 u2. Obviously, they cancel out, so it comes to 0. Okay. So we've got left hand side equals right hand side. All right. That's a proof for that. Let's now have a look at part C. Hence determine the form of W when U1 and U2 are solutions of the Legendre equation with parameter nu. Okay. So um, this sort of question would be what you more likely see in an exam. Right? I only found something like this in this particular year. Um, typically, they won't ask you to prove results like this that are already shown in the course. Um, they might, but it's unlikely. They will more likely ask you questions that ask you to apply that particular lemma with you. Okay. So let's go ahead and try and apply this result 
to this question here. Okay. So from part B, we have that um, A2 W dash plus A1 W equal to zero, right? In the Legendre equation, W dash W is still just W dash and W, but our A2 is this time one minus X squared, and our A1 is negative two X. So if you go back up, this is our A2, this is our A1, okay? All right, now this has simply turned into a first order ODE, right? We just have some coefficient times first order derivative minus some coefficient times the function itself equal to zero, okay? And we can thus solve this using an integrating factor, okay? So first, if we divide our one minus x squared on both sides, you'd be left with this. And now, and now we can just apply the integrating factor method, then you would have e to the power of the integral of this term, bx, okay? But this is simply 10 to the 1 minus x squared. And why is that? Well, that's because this here is simply equal to ln of 1 minus x squared, yeah? If you think about it, if you make the u sub one, if you make the u sub one minus x squared, this negative and two x will just be cancelled out um, with the residue. Okay, and so ultimately, you're so ultimately you're left with one minus x squared. And so, um, by this integrating factor method, we know that the integrating factor times the thing we're trying to figure out, the the derivative of the product of these two things must be equal to the other side times by this integrating factor. Right? But 0 times 1 minus x squared is just is, is 0 times 1 minus x squared is still just 0. So you end up with this um, equation here. Okay? And now if you and now if you integrate on both sides, clearly if you, clearly if you integrate 0, you would just get a constant back. So let's just let the so let's just let that constant be c. And so you would have 1 minus x squared times by w equals to c. And so w equals to c over 1 minus x squared, okay? That's example three. Okay. Um, yeah, and that pretty much does it for this Ronskian bit, All right? So typically, you might see something like part c in your exam. Less likely will you see part b. But if you do see part c, don't worry. Just remember to apply this lemma, and it will simplify down the question a lot by just turning it into a um, first order ODE. Okay. All right. Well, from here, we actually already talked about one of the strategies and that strategy was the integrating factor, right? Um, hopefully you guys, like I didn't go through that too in depth because you guys would have gone through that in first year already. Um, the stuff like integrating factor or exact equations and whatnot. Um, I will now move on to more different strategies like reduction of order, um, which is our first one here, okay? So the theorem for reduction of order, it says that if we have some sort of ODE, u double dash plus some function p, u dash plus some function q, u equals zero, so p and q's are the coefficients of u dash and u, and we have a solution for this that's non-zero, then we can always readily find a second linearly independent solution of this form. Okay. You won't go through the proof here, but we, will, but we will learn how to apply this here. Okay. So again, in exams, less likely, less likely that they will ask you to prove anything, more likely that they will ask you to apply the lemma or results you have learned in class. Okay. So let's look at example four. Show that you want you to show that u1 equal to e to the power of 2x is a solution, and then use the reduction of order method to find another one, okay? So let's firstly show that it is a solution. So if u1 equals e to the power of 2x, then u1 dash equals to that, and u1 double dash equals to that, okay? That's pretty straightforward. And now just plug it back into the initial problem, right? So x plus 2 times u double dash minus 2x plus 5 times u dash plus u um, equals this, expand everything, and then just simplify. 
right, so 4x e to the power of 2x minus this is gone. 8 e to the power of 2x plus 2 e to the power of 2x is 10 e to the power of 2x minus 10 e to the power of 2x is gone. So you're left with 0. Okay. <clears throat> now, to find a second solution, we can apply reduction of order. So u2 equals to u1 times by the integral of 1 over u1 squared and then e to the power of the integral of p. Okay. What is p in this case? Our function p in this case is this. Where did I get that from? Well, that's because um, if I divided across the board by x plus 2, I would have arrived at u double dash minus 2x plus 5 over x plus 2 plus 2 over x plus 2 u equals 0. Yeah. So remember, whenever you, whenever you want to apply reduction of order, you must have a um, monic leading coefficient. Right? So this, this coefficient here must be 1. So if you have some random stuff here, you have to first divide that across the board to make this here 1. Okay. So P is ultimately equal to this term here. Okay. So let's go ahead and evaluate this e to the power of integral B, uh, integral P first. So the integral of this thing um, actually turns out to be the integral of this thing because if we just do some manipulation, so if we turn 2x plus 5 into 2x plus 4, then this will be equal to 2x plus 2, then this and this will cancel, leaving you with negative 2 at the front. And then to get from 2x plus 5 and, sorry, to get from 2x plus 4 back to 2x plus 5, we need an extra 1, okay? And so that's why you can separate it out into these two components here. This makes it much simpler to integrate. Integrating negative 2 just becomes negative 2x. Integrating 1 over x plus 2 just becomes ln x plus 2. Okay. Let's put that into our um, formula. So you have e to the power of that thing we just found. First, e to the power of negative 2x. Um, u, u1, equals, u1 equals e to the power of negative 2x. So we write that in. Then next... Um, notice that e to the power of 4x times e to the power of negative 2x just becomes e to the power of 2x. So you would have 1 on e to the power of 2x in the denominator, which becomes e to the power of negative 2x if you bring it up to the numerator. And furthermore, you have e to the power of negative ln x plus 2. So e to the power of negative ln x plus 2 is the same as e to the power of ln 1 on x plus 2. Which is, which is the same as 1 on x plus 2, right? And so you have this thing on your denominator, so if you flip it back up, it will just become this on your numerator, okay? And furthermore, obviously, this... Um, sorry, what am I doing? Let me erase this. Okay, so let's keep going. We leave our e to the power of 2x out on the front, and we furthermore just have to integrate x plus 2 e to the power of negative 2x, I won't go through the actual integration here, but you would end up with this result. Okay. So it would be in, here would be in, here would be integration by parts. Okay. And then you will ultimately end up with this result, and then obviously e to the power of two x and e to the power of negative two x will cancel out, and so you're just left with this. So ultimately, we can pick u two to be equal to this, and this will be a second linearly independent solution. Next, let's move on. This next method I'll go through quite briefly because you would have also have learned this in first year um, in math either 1231 or math 1131, and that is solving differential equations by educated guessing. Okay. So what this theorem is, is essentially saying is if your force term on the right, so let's say you have some sort of LU equals to some force term, and this force term is some polynomial, let's say, I don't know, um, 3x squared plus 7. Then if you want to find a particular solution to this differential equation, we should pick u to be some sort of a matching polynomial. Okay, so on our right, our force term is a polynomial of degree 2. So we should pick our u, we should guess our u to be some quadratic. Okay. And then... Through making this guess, we can then plug it into our equation 
and then match the coefficients to find a, b, and c. Similarly, with exponential, same idea here. It's a bit more particular here where they can actually give you the actual answer straight away. But at the end of the day, it's not necessary to memorize the result. Rather, if you take the same approach as polynomials, it will, like, it will still make sense. So for example, if you have LU equals to some force term, and this force term is actually exponential. So let's say 3e e to the power of 4x. Then what you should do is just make the guess that u takes on this form. Okay, And go through the same motions as you would with the polynomial. And you can again compare the coefficients to find out what a is. Okay. So, yeah, so... These are the two techniques that you probably would have both already learned in first year. Essentially, just make a guess that matches what the right hand side looks like. There are, of course, there are of course some extra conditions. For example, for the polynomial, we must ensure that p of zero is not equal to zero before we can do that. Okay. So that's saying if we apply, like if we chuck in zero into our p d. So what is p d? So for example, if I have l u equals to um, u double dash plus 2u, then p of d is um, d squared plus 2. Reason being, this d operator kind of represents differentiating. So we've kind of differentiated u twice, so d squared, and here we haven't differentiated u at all, so it's just plus 2. So this polynomial here, if we plug in 0 and that's equal 0, then we can't apply this guessing method. Right? But if it but if it's not equal to zero, then we can. Okay. Similarly, here we have a condition. Um, if you have your force term is e to the power of mu x, if we plug mu into that same polynomial p that we like that we that we described above, and that equals to zero, then we can't apply it, then we can't apply this guessing method. But if it's not equal to zero, then we can. Okay. So let's have a look at an example here. Find the unique solution u to the ODE. Okay. As you can see, we have some um, differential equation where the force term is polynomial with degree 2. And we're actually given some initial conditions. Okay. Note that this forms an IVP. Reason being, um, this is of second order, and we have initial conditions up to the first order. Okay. All right, first, let's solve the homogeneous version of this ODE. So that's basically saying solve this. Okay. Well, our catrix equation is just r squared plus 4r plus 3. Again, just bring the power down. All right. So this is second order, so power is 2. First order, so power is 1. No order, so power is just 0, so just 3. So just a constant. So the roots would be negative 1 and negative 3 because you would have this. Okay. So the general solution to our homogeneous ODE will be this. It's just a linear combination of our u1, which is e to the power of negative x, and our u2, which is e to the power of negative 3x. Okay. Now, on the right-hand side, our force term is a polynomial of degree 2. And so we should make a guess for our particular solution UP that is also a general quadratic. So AX squared plus BX plus C. Okay. And so our UP dash will become 2AX plus B and our U double dash will just become 2A. Okay. We just differentiate this twice. Differentiate once, differentiate twice. Now, I have written some other stuff here. For example, um, there does not exist any polynomial terms in the homogeneous solution, and so we are free to guess this. Okay? The reason why I said that is because if our solution here, our homogeneous solution, did contain any polynomial terms, we may have had to modify our guess. Reason being, we want to make a guess that is not already contained within the homogeneous solution. If it is already contained within the, within, the homogeneous, within the homogeneous solution, then it's redundant, right? because the homogeneous solution already captures this other solution. Right? We'll come to an example after this one that will go through a case where that is the case. Okay? And so if we plug in these results back into our initial problem, 
we will have u double dash plus four times u dash plus three times u equals to the right hand side. And so by comparing the coefficients of the constants, comparing the coefficients of x, and comparing the coefficients of x squared, we would ultimately arrive at a equals 3, b equals negative 8, and c equals to 26. Okay. And so our general solution will be of this form. This is the homogeneous bit, and this here is the particular bit. Okay. Okay. Now, we keep going um, because we're not actually done yet. We have initial conditions um, of u0 equals to 1 and u dash 0 equal to 0. Um, because of time constraints, I will leave this for you guys to read when we upload the slides. Um, reason being, we've done something very similar to this already. Right, like in the first example, we already extended it to also consider how we would solve IVPs. This is the exact same situation. You just plug in your initial conditions, get a bunch of simultaneous equations, solve it, then you get C1 and C2 back, and then you have a unique solution. Okay. So I won't go through this again because it's the same sort of IVP problem. Okay. The main thing to take away was to see how we made a guess to find a particular solution. Okay. Example six, <clears throat> we have P of Z equals to z minus 1, z plus 2 squared, z squared plus 1. Write down the general solution uh of the fifth order linear homogeneous ODE, pdu. Again, you can see pd is the, is, the, is the notation they used here, where d refers to the differential operator, right? So d u will just differentiate u once, d squared u will differentiate u twice, d cubed u will differentiate u three times, and so on. Okay, that's, like, that's all the d here means. So, for part A, since our polynomial P is already given, all we have to do is read off the roots. So, so the roots are clearly 1, negative 2, negative 2, and 1, negative 1. Okay? And so our general homogeneous solution can just be written as C1 plus C2 e to the power of negative 2x, C3x e to the power of negative 2x, plus C4 cos x plus C5 sin x. Um, I believe this is, is a type for you here. This should just this should be c one e to the power of x. Okay. Why is that? That's because we have a root of one, so one of our solutions would be e to the power of x. We see negative two, so our next solution can be e to the power of negative two x. Our third solution also has a root here of negative two, but like I said before, if we want to generate an other linearly independent solution. All we have to do is slap on the variable in the front. So we get this. Okay. And then u4 and u5, these are um, complex conjugate, these are complex conjugates, and so we can do cos x by the Euler identity, and u5 can also be sin x. And so we ultimately end up with this. Okay. Now part B. Write down the form of a particular solution, UP to the inhomogeneous ODE. Okay. So what if the force term was something that looked like this? Yeah. So right now we solved it homogeneously. What if we wanted to make a guess for what a solution, what a particular solution would be if we have this as the force term? Now this looks very complicated and I will instantly just give you the answer, but we will now break it down bit by bit. <clears throat> okay, firstly, we have an e to the power of negative 2x term. Okay, so how can we deal with that? So if we have e to the power of negative 2x, the issue is that in our homogeneous solution, we also already have e to the power of negative 2x. That was our u2. So if we want to avoid having a solution already in the homogeneous solution, what we could have done to get a new linearly independent solution was to slap an x in the front. But that's still not good enough. Reason being, if we go back, we also already have x e to the power of negative 2x in our homogeneous solution. And so this would also already be contained in our homogeneous solution. So what can we do? We can slap another x, we can, we can slap another x at the front of this. 
and that brings up and that brings us up to x squared. Okay. Then we go back and check again. Does x squared e to the power of negative two x come up in our homogeneous solution? It doesn't. And so now we are free to say that okay, this can be one of our guesses. Okay. Next, we can do the same with other ones. The main thing I want to um, like the main important thing here is this part here. Okay, why is that? That's because we have our guess here of x squared cos x. Okay, so in our fourth term here, we have x squared cos x. When we see a trig term here, our guess will typically be some sort of cos x plus sin x um, in our guess. Okay, reason being, so for example, if we had the fourth term equal to cos x, it's not good enough to just guess u equals to some cos x. Because if you differentiate um, sine, you can also get coses. Right? So it's always good to guess cos plus some sort of sine term. Because as you differentiate, you can get negative x, uh, negative a sine x plus b cos x. And then you double dash and keep going, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, as you keep going, these causes and signs will keep alternating between cos and sine. So if in the fourth term there's a cause, it's important to guess both cause and sine, because the sine may end up in the end helping out and um, leading to a cause. Yeah? So that's the first thing to note, is that if there's a trig term in your fourth term, for example, cause or sine, then you have to guess both cause and sine as part of the solution. Secondly, we also have an x squared term at the front, okay? So you might be wondering, why can't we guess something like this? Why can't we guess, I don't know, let's say ax squared plus bx plus c, and then d cos x plus e sin x, okay? So since it's of the form sum quadratic times a trig function, why can't I guess it as sum quadratic times your cos plus sine? Reason being is that, Although this seems valid, it is not the it, like it is not as generalized as it can possibly get. As you can see here, we have one, two, three, four, five undetermined constants, right? Whereas in this case, this possible solution, we have one, two, three, four, five, six undetermined constants, right? We are trying we are trying to determine the most generalized form possible. And this form that has more parameters in it will of course be more generalized, okay? So that's another important thing to note. If you have some sort of polynomial times, times sort of trig or, or some sort of exponential times some sort of trig, make sure you separate it out into two different parts. So separate it out into one part here and another part here, rather than writing it like this, okay? Because this here is wrong. This here is wrong. This here is right. Okay. So that's, that's just something um, to note, right? Because I remember in um, class test one, there was something like this. Okay. Yeah. So just be careful. Um, if we have some polynomial times times some sort of trig function, that you separate it out into two bits. So you have its own quadratic times by cos plus its own quadratic times by sine or whatever polynomial it is. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. The annihilator method, we will skip past this for now. You can again read it in the slides um, when I upload the slides onto the, uh, onto the MATLAB website. Um, reason being, I personally have never seen an exam question that has the annihilator method in it. And furthermore, it's only for math triple two one students. So it won't really be of value to two one two one students. So I'll just skip it. But if you're a triple two one student and you want to know how to, or you want to revise, how to use the annihilator method, feel free to um, read through the slides once it's uploaded. Okay. okay. Now, another method that we will have a look at um, is the variation of is the variation of parameters. Okay. So this is a very powerful technique. Um, it says that if we have a second order in homogeneous ODE of this form, so 
u double dash plus some coefficient times u dash plus some coefficient times u equals to the force term f. If we know the homogeneous solutions u1 and u2, then we can make a guess. We can make a guess for the particular solution. So let me just write up here. We can make a guess for the particular solution as being some v1 function times the first homogeneous solution plus some v2 function times the u2 homogeneous solution. Okay. Um, so it's kind of extends upon the idea of if we know the homogeneous solutions, you can generate all the other solutions by having some sort of linear combination of it. We're now saying that we can in fact find a particular solution to some inhomogeneous equation by taking not the linear combination of u1 and u2, but instead by first multiplying it by some coefficient that doesn't have to be constant. Right? So it can be v1x and v2x. And through some derivations, we can ultimately get to the fact that the form for v1 and v2 must be this and this. So essentially, so essentially, variation of parameters would be important if you have some sort of f here that is unfamiliar to you and you don't really know how to use educated guessing to guess a particular solution. And so instead, what you can do is make this assumption that the particular solution will have this form and then go backwards and figure out what this v1 and v2 is by these two results here. Okay. Let's look at an example. This is a past paper question, and it says, solve this um, ODE where the force term is e to the power of x sine x. Okay. Now note that in the theorem, um, we need the run scheme. Okay. That's our denominator. Okay. So let's, let's go ahead and find that first. Firstly, our homogeneous solution will have the characteristic equations t squared plus 3t plus 2 equals 0. If you factorize this, you will get t... Um, it would be minus 2, t minus 1. And so our solutions will be e to the power of 1x, e to the power of 2x. And so to find the run skin, it will be the determinant of u1, u2, u1 dash, u2 dash. And that ends up being e to the power of 3x. Okay. Now let's go ahead and find our v1 and v2. So v1 will be equal to a negative u2 times f. So this here is u2, this here is f, and this here is the von skin. Okay, This simplifies out to cleanly negative sine x. We do the same with v2, and that cleanly simplifies to e to the power of negative x sine x. Okay? Now to find v1 and v2, all we have to do is integrate both sides. Okay? So if you integrate both sides, a v1 will become a cos, v2 will become this slightly more complicated thing, but still, it shouldn't be too difficult, right? Um, and you get this. Okay, so, so recall that v1 dash equals to the integral of negative sine x dx and v2 dash equal to the integral of negative x um, sine x. Okay, so you could figure out v1 just by direct integration and you could figure out v2 by doing two integration by parts. Okay, and now that we found v1 and v2, what we have to do is plug it back into our form. So plug it back into the form of u equals to v1, u1 plus v2, u2. Okay, and so you get cos x times u1 plus v2 times u2. Simplify a bit further and you get this answer here. Now let me move on to the last um, main component of my part, and that will be power series solutions. Okay. So if we have some sort of ODE here, we're going to mainly consider second order ODEs, like this, or like this, they're both equivalent, you just divide the A2 over to get the P's and Q's. Then what this is essentially saying is that we can then make a guess for U of this form. A equals to infinity of um, a k z to the power of k. Okay. Oh, sorry, a zero, not a. 
like k equals 0, not k equals 1. Okay. So this here is a power series, right? It's some constant, some, some coefficient, multiplied by the power of some variable. And you keep summing it to infinity. And this forms a power series. And we're saying that we can indeed find this power series solution to some ODE. Okay? And furthermore, paired with the next theorem on this page, it's saying that if the P and Q in this equation here is analytic over some region, um, so magnitude of Z is less than um, rho, then our power series solution will also be analytic over the same region of absolute value of Z is less than rho. Okay. That's basically what these two pages say, right? It says that you can form this power, like you can guess this power series solution, and furthermore, this power series solution will be analytic on the same region that P and Q are analytic on. Okay. All right. So what's the point of this? We can make this guess, but the more important thing is, once we make this guess, that we can actually go and determine what these AKs are. Because if we can't, because if we can't determine what AKs are, then there's no point, right? Um, the whole point is that we can find some sort of relationship that will generate all these AKs for us. Okay. So let's have a look at let's have a look at a simple example first. Let's say we're trying to solve this ODE here. Okay. And we want to find a power we want to find a power series solution of this form. And we also are given that these are the initial conditions. Firstly, note that if u is this, then u dash is this, then u double dash is this. Okay. So I brought the power down, so I basically applied power rule and differentiated the insides. And furthermore, note that our k have changed from k equals 0 to k equals 1, and from k equals 1 to k equals 2. Okay. Reason being, every time I differentiate, the power of the z goes down, and it wouldn't make sense in a power series solution to have the z to the power negative 1. Yeah. So we remove the k equals 0 um, iteration. Similarly here, it wouldn't make sense to have z negative 2 or z negative 1. So we remove the first two iterations. Okay, so let's substitute our u double dash, u dash, and u into our initial problem. Then you would get 1 plus z squared times u double dash would become, um, would become, let's see. Yeah, so here is the 1 minus z squared times u double dash would become your u dash minus z squared u double dash, right? So our u dash is just this. Our z squared times, sorry, it's plus here, not minus. Our z squared times u dash here would become this. Our z squared went into our power series and turned our z to the power of k minus 2 back into z to the power of k. Okay. Next, our minus z u dash. So this here is our z u dash. Okay. So the negative, and then we brought the z into the power series to get to the power of k back, right? Because remember, u dash initially was at the power of k minus 1. So we brought the z back in to become at the power of k. And then finally, minus u, okay? Now, when you ever, whenever you're doing this power series stuff, your main concern is to somehow match the bases, so match these bases, and furthermore, match your power of z. Because if we can match these bases and match these powers of z, we can merge these different power series all into one. And once you have one big summation, you can form some sort of recurrence relation on your AKs. Okay. So let's take a, let's take a look at what we do here. Um, here, what we did was we turned this one into this. Notice that nothing in the summation actually changed, just the base change. And why is that allowed? When we think about it, k equals 0 and 1 doesn't actually affect the sum at all. When I plug in 0, this will be 0, so the entire thing will be 0. When I plug in 1, this will be 0, so the entire thing will be 0. So essentially, I'm just adding two more zeros to the front. I'm doing 0 plus 0 plus blah, 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 blah. Okay? But the point of turning this 2 into 0 is such that it matches these other two summations here. Now the last thing we have to worry about is to turn this 
and 2 equals 0. Okay. Okay. So ultimately, the last three sums turn to this. Right. So that's just these three can combine together. And we're still, still left with this term out the front. Now, let's change um, our k into a k plus 2 for this first term here. Okay. Why is that? Well, that's because it would that's because it will change our base from k equals 2 to k equals 0. And furthermore, we'll change our z to the power of k minus 2 into zk. Okay? It's trivial that, of course, if I change k to k plus 2, obviously this will become k. Because I'll, because I'll have k plus 2 minus 2, which is k. Okay? Why does this change from 2 to 0, though? Well, that's for the same reason as before, right? If I'm bumping up my k values in here, I must be decreasing my k value here. Because okay? otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to um, be skipping values, right? Because, for example, in this summation here, I still have a z to the power of 0 and a z to the power of um, 1 term, right? Because I because I'll have k equals to 2 will give me z to the power of 2 minus 2, k equals 3 will give me z to the power of 3 minus 2. If I left this just as 2 and not change it, and not change it to 0, I would be missing these terms because I would now immediately be starting at z to the power of 2, z cubed, and so on, okay? So it's important to change this to zero, okay? But now that's great because now our basis match and our powers of z match, and so we can all combine into one big sum. So we have our zk's factorized out, our k equals zero as the base, that's common. And on the inside, we have this huge um, recurrence relation, okay? Now what do we do with this? Record that we were trying to solve this equal to zero, right? And now, if this is uniformly zero everywhere, it can't be that the z is uniformly zero everywhere, or else we would just have the trivial solution, and we don't want the trivial solution, right? So it must be that this thing here is uniformly zero everywhere, okay? But if that's the case, then we can form this recurrence relation, and then rearranging for our ak's, you would get that ak plus 2 equals to this constant times ak. Okay. Now, if we go ahead and continue trying to find out what the solution would be, well, just notice that at a5, you would have negative 3 minus 3, right? This is, a, this is k plus 2. This is 2 less. So if it's a5, this would be 3 minus 3 on the top. So 3 minus 3 would be 0. So a5 term and onwards, it would just be 0. Okay. There. So basically, it's saying that the coefficient of this term is equal to 0 times at the power of 5, because that's just 0. And obviously, every term after that, let's say a7 to the power of 7, would also be 0. a9 to the power of 9 would also be 0. Because all these next terms, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, would all be dependent on a5 because of the recurrence relation. Okay. Furthermore, a1 equals 6, a3 equals 4. Um, so I believe that we're given initial conditions. Right? So using the initial conditions, we can find out um, we can find out what a1 and a3 are. And furthermore, all the even terms are also just 0. Okay. Um, so how do we get that? Well, let me take a look. Yeah, u0 equals 0, right? u0 equals 0 will give us all that all the even terms are 0. Why is that? Because u equals to this, right? And so u of 0 will make all of the z terms vanish except for z to the power of 0. This would just be a zero, but the initial condition tells us tells us that this is zero. Right? So a zero is zero, but if a zero is zero, then all of the successive even terms must also be zero, because again, a two would depend on a zero, a four would depend on a zero, a six would depend on a zero, and so on. So ultimately, our answer is just this. Okay. Okay. Now let's move on to. Um, 
Cauchy Euler ODEs. So here yeah, we already had a look at what singular ODEs are. A Cauchy Euler ODE is the one that takes on this form. Okay, so it must be in particular some constant times x squared u double dash plus some constant times x u dash plus c times u. Right, so essentially you can remember it by saying that the power of your x must always match your um, order of the derivative, right? So 1 matches with 1, and then this x to the power of 0 here. 0 matches with 0. Okay? And for a quadruple ODE, the guess that we will make will be u equal to x to the power of r, right? as I said here. Okay? Um, don't necessarily need to know why this is the case, right? but a bit of intuition would be as you differentiate u, your power of r will go down, right? Like u dash will become r x to the power of r minus 1. u double dash will, u double dash will become r minus 1, um, r times r minus 1, x to the power of r minus 2, right? So for example, u dash will become this, u double dash will, will become this, right? So if every successive, with, with every successive derivative, the power of x will go down, but since our coefficient here has x squared to match the u double dash. We have an x here to match the u dash and so on. This power here will help, I guess, negate the fact that the power went down. Right, so for example, x squared times this here will bring x, r to, x to the power of r minus 2 back to x to the power of r. Similarly, this x here will help bring this back up to x to the power of r. Okay? And so that's how we make this guess, because at the end, we will then have three terms that are all of x to the power of r, okay? So similar to how at the beginning I said we make the guess of e to the power of something t, because as you differentiate it, it keeps returning back to the same form. For Cauchy Euler ODE, same, same intuition here, we're guessing x to the power of something because as you differentiate x to the power of r and then plug it back into the Cauchy Euler ODE, it will return back to the same form of x to the power of r. In the same way that we have a um, characteristic equation for homogeneous um, ODEs that we saw previously, for the Cauchy Euler ODE, we have our own sort of equation, and it's called um, the initial equation. Okay. So as you can see, it's somewhat similar to characteristic equation, but not fully. Right. The main difference is that you have this first term is r times r minus one instead of just ar squared. Okay. So essentially what I'm saying here is if you plug in x to the power of r, go through the motions of solving this homo of solving this homogeneously, you will end up with this as your equation that you have to solve. And it's and it's such an important equation that we give it a name and we call it the initial equation. Okay. These two lemmas are basically what are basically what I just said. Lemma three says that we would make the guess x to the power of r. We can find these values of r by solving the initial equation. Similar to how in the more simpler cases, we have a guess of e to the power of rt, and we can find the r's by solving the, um, by solving the, by solving the characteristic equation. In this case, we also have r's, and we can solve these r's by solving the initial equation. Okay. Lemma four. This is similar to um, the fact that if you have double roots, you can generate a second linearly independent solution by slapping on an x. In this case, you don't slap on an x, instead you slap on a log of x, okay? Example 10. Find the general solution of the Cauchy Euler ODE. So this, this equation here, where you have this as the force on the right, okay? Now note that this is not a simple, like this is not an ordinary Cauchy Euler problem. Reason being on the right, we don't have a form that we know how to guess for, right? It's not a trig function, it's not some polynomial function, it's not a exponential function, it's x to the power of a quarter, okay? And so you note that this will be one of the applications where we apply variation of parameters um, to a question where we kind of have to because we don't have any other techniques to solve it, okay? That's why I said previously that the variation of parameters is, is quite a powerful technique because it can help us solve equations where we don't have any other possible techniques to solve it. 
Okay. Okay, but firstly, let's go through the Cauchy oil a bit. Our equation is 2x squared y double dash plus 7xy dash plus 3y. So the initial equation will become 2r r minus 1 plus 7r plus 3. Right? So this 2 comes up here, this 7 comes up here, and this 3 comes up here. Set this equal 0, and we solve it. Okay. You go through the calculations and you solve it, you end up with r equal to negative 3 on 2 or negative 1. And so our two homogeneous solutions are this and this. Okay. Now to find a particular solution, we need to uh, we need to apply the variation of parameters. Okay. Um, I'll quickly go through this example here, like very briefly, but I won't go through in too much detail because we have already seen an example for variation of parameters. So it's the exact same thing, but just a different a different values here. Okay. So recall what the variation of parameters. Um, results are, you would have u equals to v1 times u1 plus v2 times u2, where v, v1 follows this result and v2 follows this result. Okay. Let's just have a look at v1. Okay. Let's first complete the run skin. You will go through the calculations. You will end up with the fact that the run skin equals to half x to the power of negative 7 on 2. Okay. Then v1 will just become the integral of negative y2 times f over wx. Now before we go straight to plugging in the values, we must first re, I guess, rearrange the equation, okay? Reason being, we can only apply variation of parameters if the coefficient of y double dash is one, okay? So we must first divide 2x, get, 2x squared across the board. Okay? We end up with this force term instead, and that's why this goes into our f, right? Not this. Okay, this, 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 this does not go into our f. It will be this. Okay. Simplify it a bit, we end up with 13 integral of x to the power of 3 and 4. That should be simple enough. You integrate that, then you end up with this result here. Okay. We can do a similar thing for v2. And ultimately, if you put it all together, you'll get y p equals to um, v1, y1 plus v2 y2, and you get this result. And so ultimately, our general form, our general solution will just be the homogeneous bit plus the particular bit. Okay? And okay, the last important bit of this of this section will be the from will be the will be the Frobenius normal form. So um, the, the Frobenius normal form will be something of this form. So the main difference between this and the cauchy euler form is that this stuff here no longer needs to be a constant, right? It can be some function as well. And the thing is that we still have a method to solve this, and that will be to make a guess of this form. So it looks like a power series, but it's not fully, because zeta power of r, this r, doesn't necessarily have to be an integer. It can be a fraction, it can be, it can be negative, it can be a fraction, it can be negative, it can be any real number, okay? How do you find this R? This R will come from an approximating cauchy euler equation. Okay, so this is the Frobenius normal form. If we set P0 to be P0 and Q0 to be Q0, we can form an approximating cauchy euler equation of this form. Okay, then we, yep, then we are back in the cauchy euler setting because we have a constant here and a constant here, okay? Then we find the R from this cauchy euler approximating um, equation, okay? And that R will simply just be the solution to the initial equation with the constants P0 here and the constant Q0 here, okay? Now, important to note is that if, um, if your R's differ by, a, um, by an integer, you will not get two linearly independent solutions. However, in this course and in the exam, you will pretty much never encounter a case where that happens, right? Um, but yeah, but just important note here is that if your two R's that you get out of this equation ends up differing by just an integer or a whole number, then there, like, then there will be a problem, right? Like, like this technique will no longer fully work, okay? 
All right, let's give you an example here. This here is a Frobenius normal form equation because this here is non-constant. Okay. Determine the initial equation and its roots of the ODE. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So firstly, note that our p function is just one, right? Because it's just one times x y dash, and our q is x squared minus one on nine, which is this here. When I plug in zero, of course, p will stay as one. When I plug in zero, q will turn into negative one on nine because this term will vanish. Okay, and so the approximating Cauchy-Euler equation will be this: right? x squared y double dash plus p zero y dash plus q zero y. Okay, and so the in, and so the initial equation will be r r minus one plus r minus one on nine. We solve that, and we end up getting i equals to plus minus one on three. Okay. Now, the question in part B tells us to use the larger one of the two roots, and they want us to find the first three non-zero terms of the power C solution. Okay. So we will select i equals to one third, because that's obviously bigger than negative a third, and we, and we will now go through um, the working out for finding a solution in Frobenius normal form. Okay. So again, we're going to make our guess as being x to the power of r, and then the sum, right? But we bring this x to the power of r in, so that we get k plus r in our exponent here. Then note that y dash will be this, and y double dash will be this, just differentiating the inside. Note that here, however, we do not change k equals 0. Okay? This stays the same. This is different to the power series uh, method, reason being, like we like, like we, like, we like we previously said, our r doesn't have to be a positive whole number. It can be negative, it can be fractional, it can be any real number. All right? So it won't make sense for us anymore to bump k up to 1, bump k up to 2. Right? Because this in itself doesn't even have to be x to the power of a whole number anymore. It can be x to the power of any real number. Okay? That's why it's okay to leave k equals 0 here. Okay? Now, it's pretty much the same, um, I guess, idea as the power series method, right? So if we plug in the values of y double dash, y dash, and y, you will get this, which is this, you will get this, which is this, and you will get this, which is this, and you will get this, which is this, okay? The x squared, I brought the power in to get back to k plus r. The x, I brought the power in to get back to k plus r. Um, and then for this term, still does k plus r. And then for this term, which is the odd term out, we have k plus r plus 2, because you have x squared brought into k plus r already. Okay. Now, obviously, the first three terms can all be grouped together already. right? The base is the same. The power is the same. Okay. This last term is the odd one out. Right. Now, how can we deal with this last term? Well, this last term, we can fix it, with a, like we can bring the power down to k plus r by raising k up by 2. Okay, So, it's, so essentially what we're doing here is, is that we're turning k into k minus 2. Okay, But if we turn our k into k minus 2 in the inside, then our base must go up by 2. Okay, Plus by this term here. Okay, Now, we're nearly able to... When we're nearly able to group everything together, right? We have the same powers here. The only issue is that we now have different bases. Okay. To fix that, note that in our first summation term here, so this one here, we can just explicitly write out what k equals zero is, what that term becomes, and what k equals one term becomes. Right? So you would have <clears throat> the k the k equals zero term will turn into this. The k equals one term will turn into this. That's simply just from plugging in k equals 0 into here and plugging in k equals 1 into there as well. Okay. Now, given that i equals to 1 third, we will get also initial conditions on our a0 and a1. Okay. If you plug in i equals 1 third into here, that'll be 1 ninth minus 1 ninth. So that'll be 0. And so if we're comparing coefficients to the right-hand side, if we compare the coefficients of the a of the x to the power of r term 
you would have a0 times 0 equals to 0. Both 0 is already equal to 0, so our a0 can take on any value. That's why a0 becomes a free parameter. Whereas a1, if you plug in 1 third into here, this will obviously not become 0. So then you will have a1 times this 1 third plus 1 squared minus 1 9 equal to 0. But since this can't be equal to 0, a1 must be equal to 0. And that's where you get this, and that's where you get this initial condition from. Right? So this will tell us in the future that all the even terms will exist, but all the odd terms will not exist. Because if a1 is here, then a3 won't exist, then a5 won't exist, and so on. Okay. Okay. So if we just consider um, k equals 2 onwards, we can now group the entire sum together, and that will form this big sum here. If we factorize our x to the power k plus r, we will then get a recurrence relation between a k and a k minus 2, which ends up being this. Okay? And like I just mentioned, since a1 is 0, only the even terms will exist, because if a1 equals 0, and since a3 is dependent on a1, this will be something a1, but a1 itself is 0, so that will be 0. Then a5 depends on a3, which depends on a1, so that will also be 0, and so on. Okay? So the first three non-zero terms will just be the first three even terms. Okay, and so if you go ahead and find out what a0 is, what a2 is, what a4 is, by using this potential relation, you will ultimately end up with this as your answer. Okay, that pretty much concludes my section. Right? We also have a few slides here on the Bessel and Legendre's equations. Um, I won't go too in-depth in this, Again, I'll leave it up on the slides for you guys to read when we do upload the slides. But Bessel really comes up a bit more um, often in later chapters. Right? As long as you know what the Bessel equation looks like, um, that's pretty much all you need to know. Right? And that the solutions have this sort of form here. Okay? Yeah. One useful fact about Bessel's function is that the solutions, if they... If this parameter here is not integer, you will get linearly independent solutions simply by considering this and this. But if your new here is in fact an integer, then this and this will be linearly dependent. Okay, in fact, they will have this relationship here. Okay. And for Lagrange's equations, um, it's only for triple two one, and furthermore. You don't need to know this too in depth. You just need to know what the equation is like. Um, and at the end of the day, both Legendre's and Bessel's equation, the technique to solve them is exactly the same as the power series method that we learned. Okay? So that, as you can see, this here is just a Frobenius normal form equation, right? You have this here being a non-constant. And Legendre's equation is simply also just a Frobenius normal form equation because this is non-constant. Um, yeah, because that's non-constant, right? That's all, yeah? Um, but yeah, you'll go through Bessel's equation a bit more in depth a bit later in the later chapters. But besides that, I'll leave it here for now. And now I've gone a little bit over time, so this seminar might run about maybe 20 minutes over time. Um, but I'll now hand it over to James to take on the second half of part one. Okay. So just hold on for a second, and I will... That James hop on. Okay. Yep, looks like I'm visible. Can you hear me as well, Jay? Just hit me up on Messenger if you can. Yeah, okay, cool. All right. So I'm James. I will be taking the second half of this, um, I guess, first half of this two-part seminar. Um, I am going to be talking about some dynamical systems. So you've just seen with Jay a lot of techniques for solving, I guess, just single differential equations. So someone gives you one differential equation, says, how can I solve it? You've just learned a couple techniques that you could use to um, try to solve those. Um, 
But what if someone was to come up with a system of differential equations? So not just one, but maybe two, maybe three, um, and they're not just individually solvable. So you can't just go down the list, solve each one, and magically claim that you've solved the system. Perhaps there's some sort of degree of dependence um, amongst your equations. Well, what you end up with is something kind of a, called a dynamical system. Um, and as you can imagine, the more differential equations you add, the harder this gets. So uh, the kind of theory that we're going to be talking about in this part of the seminar, and which you discuss in this course, is not particularly deep, but it is enough to get quite a lot done, um, at least on a basic level. So when we're talking about a dynamical system, this is usually in relation to some sort of uh, you know, physical system. So differential equations, they might govern the dynamics of that system. Um, and I guess more formally, when we're speaking about the dynamics of this system, we're really talking about um, the evolution of the state of that system. So we might have a couple of state variables, um, which I have called here natural variables. Um, you might have n of them, let's say, um, the kth one just denoted uh, x sub k. And they're going to be a function of some single independent variable, most commonly just time. Um, so you might be looking at a system that evolves over time, in which case each of your state variables is just going to be an independent function of t. Um, and so all in all, you can write your state at any given time t um, as a vector like this, where all of your components are just uh, the value of your individual state variables at that time. So we're going to be seeing differential equations that involve uh, vectors like this, rather than just individual functions. So going forward, we will keep the assumption that we're only working with a single independent variable. So we'll just keep to time uh, for this theory that we'll develop. A system of ordinary differential equations of this form. So you know, I've got this vector derivative here. Really what I mean by that is that component-wise, we're taking the derivative of each um, state variable with respect to time, of course. Uh, and we want to say that this is equal to some vector valued vector field function that we've got here. Um, if we have a system like this, this is what we call an autonomous system. Now, one thing to note here is that we don't actually have any t's here. So no t's on their own here. Obviously, we you know, might have t's just with the fact that, you know, this um, state vector that we've got here is obviously just a vector of components. And each of these is, you know, obviously dependent on time. Um, but if there are actually independent terms with this t variable that appear outside of these um, state variables, we do have actually have a different name for these um, systems. So if it explicitly depends on t, explicitly depends on t, then we call this system non-autonomous. So we have autonomous and non-autonomous systems. Um, you might ask, well, what the heck just happened? <laughs> okay, I resized my taskbar. Um, okay, to get back on track, you might think, okay, I have two different types of systems. Do I need two separate theories for how to solve these? Uh, well, as it turns out, no, because if I have some non-autonomous ODE of this form, then if X is a solution to this, so if X is some state vector, um, you know, with all of the state components, you know, figured out what should they be, um, as functions of T. If that's the case, I can actually write this, extend it in a really cool way into a solution of an autonomous ODE. So the way that I'll do that is I will define a new state vector y, uh, where I've essentially got all of my components from um, the original vector, but I've added a trivial sort of component. So this here is an n component vector. Uh, I have added in an n plus one component, and I've just basically said that y n plus one t is exactly just t. So now when I go and differentiate this, obviously I differentiate t with respect to itself, I get one, uh, which is why we've got a one here. This is now completely independent of t, right? Again, obviously, we're going to have t's appearing just because, you know, that's what the state variables depend on. But the point is, we don't actually have any t's appearing on their own. Um, so if I do this little transformation, I've actually managed to turn a non-autonomous ODE into an autonomous one. 
Um, so the upshot of this is that we can kind of just focus on autonomous systems. Um, and if we're given a non-autonomous system, we can do this transformation here um, and then use all the methods that we've learned for autonomous ODEs. Uh, now, there is this comment about the fact that F and G are technically vector fields. I mean, you know, if, if that's notable, then sure, I guess. Um, not too notable in this course, just because that notion isn't really used very much, but um, something to keep in mind. So the fact that we have bold Fs and bold Gs here is actually, you know, more than just suggestive of vector fields, they are vector fields. So that's all well and good. We, we know what a... Um, dynamical system is, I guess a natural question to ask is, okay, if I'm given a system kind of like this, when does this have a solution? And if I do have a solution, is it the only one? Is it a unique solution? Well, not quite an easy question to answer. Um, in order to answer this, we do need a requisite concept from analysis first. Um, we need something called Lipschitz continuity. So it's a strictly stronger model of continuity um, than the one we use in the you know, regular sense. And it's even uh, more strict than a different kind of continuity you may have seen before called uniform continuity. Um, we'll see the relationship between these two concepts in a minute, but uh, we'll talk about what Lipschitz means. So if I've got some function uh, on a closed and bounded compact interval, a Lipschitz constant for this function is any number L such that if you take the distance on the real line between the point evaluations of F at any two points, this is no more than a fixed multiple from the distance between the input values. So the key thing to note here is this L is actually fixed. So if I was to pick X is equal to two and Y is equal to one, uh, or X is equal to three and Y is equal to negative one, assuming both of those pairs of values are in my interval, um, this L here has actually got to work for both of them. And it's got to work for any such pair. Now, if such a constant exists, we say that this function F is Lipschitz continuous. So, you know, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so often we just say F is Lipschitz. So if someone says a function is Lipschitz, they mean it's Lipschitz continuous. Um, just to kind of wet our toes, we'll have a look at an example, but as promised, here is the relationship between some other um, models of continuity you might have seen before. Um, this first result here is basically just saying that Lipschitz implies uniformly continuous. Um, and the second one here is that if you've got continuous differentiability, so um, if the derivative of your function exists and it is a continuous function on a compact interval, so an interval that kind of looks like this, um, if we're working on the real line, uh, then that's enough to say that it's actually Lipschitz continuous. Uh, and you don't actually have to give the Lipschitz constant here. So you don't have to find what L is. Uh, if you've got a continuously differentiable on a compact interval function, you can immediately say, all right, it's Lipschitz. Um, the point of bringing up this first example here is that it's a nice way to kind of appeal to the contrapositive and show something is not Lipschitz. Because you can imagine if you go to the definition, you've, you've sort of got to show that uh, no matter how you choose your constant L, um, you're never going to get a completely strict bound all of the time, uh, which can be a bit of a pain. So, yeah, let's have a look at an example. So we have the tangent function, and we want to see whether it's Lipschitz on two intervals. One here is from negative pi on 3 to pi on 3. And then one is the open interval from negative pi on two to pi on two. Um, and we'll see why um, a particular part of the statement that we had um, was actually true on the previous slide. So if we're looking at first the I1 interval, I mean, what kind of theorems have we got here? All right, what, what options do we have? Option one could find a Lipschitz constant we could do that, but, you know, we need to work with inequalities and all of that and, you know, find a value that works and prove that it works. Um, that's a bit of a pain. So perhaps I might want to look at this theorem here because we know how tangent behaves. We know what the graph of tangent looks like. It's, you know, sort of something that looks a bit like this. I mean, yes, it has this nasty, you know, asymptotic um, nature around, um, you know, 
pi on 2, negative pi on 2, whatever. But elsewhere, it's actually a very well-behaved function. It's not quite bounded, but it is at least continuous. So more than that, we can actually say that it's differentiable. We know how to differentiate tangent x. So, you know, why not invoke that theorem that we had previously that said that a function which is continuously differentiable on some compact interval, and I1 is certainly compact, um, why don't I invoke that theorem? That's exactly what I'm going to do. So if f is continuously differentiable, which it is, on some compact interval, which it is, then we can immediately say that f is Lipschitz on this first interval, I1. So without actually having to give the Lipschitz constant and do any sort of yucky math, I've basically just used facts I already know about tangent to say that yes, this is Lipschitz. Um, that's convenient. What about with my second interval? So what happens with I2? Well, I guess you can kind of see if you think about how the graph of tangent works, you know, if this is uh, negative pi on two, this here is plus pi on two, um, we're going to get some pretty nasty behavior where it's going to you know, keep going in this way forever and keep going that way forever. Um, so it's going to be undefined at these two values. Now, if it's undefined at these two values, then it means that, you know, I can get arbitrary close um, to these poles here and the distance between the function values is going to be as big as I like, right? So sort of it stands to reason that no matter which Lipschitz constant I pick on this interval, um, I'm always going to be able to get close and closer to, you know, plus or minus pi on two uh, to where the distance between those two function values is going to be, you know, as big as I like. So, you know, it fails to be Lipschitz on I2 because no Lipschitz constant will exist because, well, it's going to be unbounded near, I guess certainly it's going to be unbounded near plus pi on two. Um, same is obviously true for negative pi on two, but really we only need unboundedness at one point. Um, that's enough to sort of seal the deal. So what went wrong? Um, the problem here is if you look at this interval that we've got, um, the open interval here, the fact that it's open is kind of a problem. Um, so this interval here is not compact. So if you remember back to your math um, 2 triple 1, you, you may have come across this notion of compactness, closed and bounded. Um, this interval here, while it's bounded, is not closed. So um, that's a pretty key assumption to make here, but not something that's terribly important. Um, so we found that f was Lipschitz on the interval i1 before. Why don't, just for you know, the sake of argument, why don't we actually try and find what a Lipschitz constant is? Um, I've sort of pre-filled the first bit of the solution here just because, you know, um, A, we're running over time, and B, um, it's a very useful trick to see, so I'll just explain it. Um, if we go back and look at the definition of what it means to be Lipschitz, here it is. Um, you can see that on one hand, I've got, you know, f of x minus f of y, and on the other hand, I've got something that looks like, you know, x minus y. Now, if you remember back to first year, this is a heck of a lot like what the MVT says. So the mean value theorem is kind of, you know, uh, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, this is going to be equal to, you know, the value of the derivative at some point, right? That is going to be really helpful here because if I apply the MVT, which you know, all of the assumptions are satisfied here, I won't go into too much rigor about why that is, but you know, should be pretty clear why that's the case. Um, if I take any empty, not empty, I should say, um, open interval inside I1, then by the MVT, I'm ensured that there is some C in this open interval such that you know, if I take tangent X minus tangent Y, this is going to be equal to, well, this here is just f dash c, but we know how to differentiate tangent. We just get sec squared. So I'm guaranteed that there is some value of c in the interval such that this equality here holds. So this is what we need almost for a Lipschitz constant. We've got an exact equality here, but you know, we, we would like an inequality. And we'd also, I guess, like for this to be an actual number rather than, you know, just some, oh, well, you know, it exists. So how can we actually put a bound on this sex squared C thing? Well, there are quite a few ways you could do this. I mean, if you 
really wanted to, you could find the turning point of this and then, you know, differentiate it yet again and show that it's a, um, a maximum, whatever. But probably a nicer way to do this is just to see, well, since we're working on, this should be I1, we have, well, if you think about how the graph of cosine looks on this interval from negative pi on three to plus pi on three, kind of looks a bit like this, right? It starts off at one at zero and then obviously cosine's an even function. So then it decreases and you know eventually when it hits pi on two, we know that it's zero. But at pi on three and also negative pi on three, we get a function value of a half. This will be the minimum value and this inequality sign should be the other way around. But um, cosine C has its minimum value at cosine pi on three, which is exactly equal to a half. So if we flip everything on its head, well, that just means that sec of C is gonna be less than or equal to two. And now if we square it, then you know, we get what we're really after, which is you know, a bound on sec squared. That's just gonna be four, two squared, right? So if I do this, then I'm able to find out that this, you know, absolute value of sec squared C thing um, is really no bigger than four. So I can take L equals four as my Lipschitz constant and I'm done. So, you know, I could have gone this way first in order to prove that tangent was Lipschitz, or I could just use an easy theorem. Um, what we need for solutions and, you know, existence of, and uniqueness of those solutions to um, dynamical systems, we need something a bit more general. We're obviously working with vector fields, so we would hope that there's some sort of notion of Lipschitz continuity for vector fields. Turns out there is exactly such a thing. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but it is in spirit kind of like the um, one for just one dimensional functions that we saw before. So again, you've got the same thing where now you're taking the Euclidean norm. So you know, this norm here, standard two norm, Euclidean norm, you've seen it before. Um, if you take the norm between the point evaluation of this vector field at these two vectors, uh, this is going to be no more than a constant multiple of the norm between the two input vectors themselves. So it is very much the same um, as the you know, real number case, just with some vectors. And obviously this time we're taking the norm. Now, there is another kind of Lipschitz for vector fields, and this is actually the one that we're going to need in order for, you know, our existence and uniqueness theorem to work. Um, a time-dependent vector field. So this time we've got one of those, I guess, um, non-autonomous vector fields on the right-hand side. Um, this here is going to be Lipschitz in X, by which I mean it's really just Lipschitz in this first argument here. If, you know, if you plug in any time and any two input vectors, you still have the same thing going, right? So any two vectors x and y at any time t, it's going to be, you know, the norm here is bounded by a constant multiple at most of the distance between the two vectors. You don't need to read into this too much, but you know, it's just there. Um, and this is another thing you don't really have to read into too much because um, this is a very technical result. I don't think it's ever actually been used very much. Um, and if so, it's, it's not used very hard, but, um, this here is the existence and uniqueness theorem that we've sort of been working to. Um, I'm not going to go into it just because it's quite technical and probably isn't too useful to know. Um, but I guess if you're trying to get a hundred in the course or something, then maybe this is something useful to look at. Um, and there is a note on the notation that I've used here. Once you're reading, if you don't know what I mean by a C1 function, I mean a once continuously differentiable function. But again, I'll leave the details to when these slides are posted. So that's enough of, I guess, the general setting of dynamical systems. But the case which leads to a tenable theory that we can actually cover in a course like this, and also one that's you know reasonably common for a lot of simple problems, is the linear case. So we've seen how in real numbers, you know, if we had a uh, differential equation that looks like this, we ended up getting, um, you know, exponential terms somewhere in the solution for this. So if we have something similar for a first order system of ODEs, 
it's going to be linear if it looks a bit like this. So if the vector field that you're setting your um, vector derivative equal to, if it has the form a of t x plus b of t, where a of t is some matrix valued function, it takes a time and it gives you a matrix. And similarly, if you've got you know, some vector valued function b of t, put in a time, get back a vector. If your vector field has this form, we call this a linear ODE. Uh, and this system is going to be autonomous, obviously, when a and b are constant, because we drop this dependency on t. But that means that this um, a function and this b function here can't be dependent on time, so they just have to be some fixed matrix and vector. If we're just working with linear problems, then we actually have a <laughs> much simpler and nicer result for the existence. So if a and b are continuous, so you know, continuous is a bit trippy here because really what I'm talking about is continuous as vector and matrix valued functions, which if you try to think about is you know, a little bit cooked, but um, that's sort of what we need here. So we need these to be you know, continuous vector and matrix valued functions. If that's the case on this closed interval from zero to t, then the linear IVP prescribed by these two equations with this initial condition. So this is an initial value problem this time. This has a unique solution on that interval, basically. So if we have continuity of this um, you know, A and B pair, then we have a unique solution that satisfies also this initial condition. Um, dumbing down our um, case under consideration just a little bit more, um, what if we were to just say, okay, let's ignore this vector. Let's just ignore whatever you know, offset term we're applying. Um, so we're just working with purely a system that looks a bit like this. Um, so dx dt equals ax. So this matrix vector multiplication. If we assume that a is a full rank, i.e. it's got non-zero determinant, i.e. Um, you know, all rows are leading columns, whatever characterization of this you like, um, then the general solution to this system that we've got here for some yet as undetermined coefficient ci is just going to be this big sum of um, some constant times the exponential of lambda i t times vector vi, where this lambda i and vi thing is the ith eigenvalue and eigenvector pair. So obviously if we've got a full rank matrix, then we've got a um, full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, so if we have something like this, solving this system is really just, you know, finding the eigenpairs, i.e. the eigenvalues and their corresponding eigenvectors, uh, which is quite a nice reduction. So in order to more succinctly express this answer that we've got here, we can talk about extending the exponential function for real numbers to matrices. So now we're talking about exp as a function on square matrices, I guess C here technically, um, you know, back onto itself. So this is now no longer a function of real numbers, uh, but we define it in much the same way. Because if I just plug my um, matrix in here, then, well, I know roughly for real numbers what the series expansion of this is. It has this um, Maclaurin series here, you know, x to the k over k, k factorial. Uh, if I just replace x, the real number, with a, the matrix, uh, it ends up working out. So, you know, there's a bunch of convergent stuff that you sort of have to pause and think about, but um, matrices are quite well behaved, so this actually doesn't end up being a problem. Um, and you end up with the exponential being formally this infinite sum here. So now if I have this initial valued system with initial conditions specified, the solution to this is actually more succinctly just written as um, the matrix exponential of TA, so T times our matrix A, that'll give me a matrix. So this E to the TA thing is a matrix. If I then take the vector product with the initial um, value of my state vector at time zero, then this will be my solution. And maybe if you're looking for an exercise just from some extra revision, you might want to try and prove this again. So this would have been covered in your lecture, but 
Um, it's, it's not that hard to prove, is what I'm saying. And it might make for a good exercise. So we'll look through an example from a past paper on the topic of matrix exponentials. This one is from a um, Math 2 on 2 on paper from all the way back in 2016. Uh, the premise of this question is that if I've got some um, eigenvector and eigenvalue pair, then if I was to take the matrix exponential, the matrix vector product with that eigenvalue, then really what I end up with is um, e to the power of that eigenvalue scaling that eigenvector. So this is you know a result that sort of looks like this, except now we've sort of added our e's in. So how would we go about proving this? Well, it's doable using just everything I've shown. Um, and everything I've really shown at this point is this formal expansion here. So this is really all I've said about how to calculate the matrix exponential. So we should probably use it. Um, if I start with this equation here, then e to the av, if I expand it out just a little bit more formally, this is my infinite sum for what e to the a is. Um, you know, technically, I could write it a bit like this, where I could have this as a um, matrix multiplying the vector, but I'm able to take this vector in to the sum, which I'll do because it's convenient. So now I've got this sum of this matrix vector product, so this infinite sum of vectors. The reason I've taken it in is because now I can look at this a to the kv thing and think about, hmm, what is this going to be equal to? Well, maybe you know already, maybe you don't, but this will actually just end up being um, lambda to the kv. Now, why is that the case? Well, if I was to look at a squared v, well, I can write this as a times on the right, the vector product with a v. I have to be very careful about the way I bracket this because I'm working with matrices. But if I do this, I know that v is an eigenvector. So this will really just be equal to a lambda v like this. Obviously this thing here is a scalar, so I can just you know, take it out the front. I've now got lambda a v, but I can use the fact that again, v is an eigenvector to say that this is actually lambda squared v. So it seems to be the case that if you've got this power here, it lines up with the power of the um, eigenvalue and you can extend this by induction or just sort of <laughs> say, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Looks like it works out. Um, and you can actually use it in the general case. So it is the case here that this term here and this term here are the same. Now I've still got this vector v on the inside. It's probably convenient at this point to rip it back out again. So in the next step, that's what I'm going to do. So now this vector v here is actually being multiplied by this real number. So this is no longer a matrix anymore. It's a real number. Um, but we know exactly what this is. This is just the definition of e, right? We're just evaluating the e exponential function at this value lambda, right? So all in all, we get the result that we were looking for. So this thing here is e to the lambda. Um, and this is just scaling the eigenvector. Again, because we brought this out the front. And that's really the end of that. So nice little exercise just using the properties of matrix exponentials and a bit of you know eigenvalue eigenvector theory. So, all right. That's a nice function you've got there. You've, you've extended it for matrices, but why do I care? Well, if we go back and we look at the um, justification I gave, well, it's because if I know my matrix exponential, then I can write the solution to this system in this very, very compact way. But I haven't actually told you about an easy way to calculate this yet. I've just sort of shown, okay, that's what it is. Conceptually, how can I work with it? How do I actually do this in practice? Well, as you can imagine, if I have to sit there and evaluate an infinite sum, I'm going to be there forever, right? So I'm going to need a way to, one, make this possible to do in a finite number of steps, but two, I also want to make this not that hard. Like, I still would like this to be reasonably painless to calculate. Um, in general, unfortunately, it's a little bit unsatisfying to say this, but you can't really do it in a not painful way. Um, but we do have a couple of um, little shortcuts if they're available to us that we can use. So the first one is if I've got a nilpotent matrix, which is to say that um, if after a certain point 
um, I raise my matrix to a big enough power, I end up getting the zero matrix, then, you know, for every subsequent power, like a to the n plus one, um, this is just a times, you know, a n, but this here is zero. So this whole thing comes out to be the zero matrix again. So if I have this sort of null potency going on of degree n, um, then I can immediately kill off basically everything that comes after in some infinite tail, right? Because all of these a to the k's here in this sum here are going to be zero. So I can basically just disregard an infinite tail of this sum uh, and only work with the first things that are actually non-zero. And the hope here would be that, um, you know, this number n, the number of times you have to raise this matrix to a power in order to get zero, we would hope that it's small. Uh, but if it's big, you know, that's not too helpful because, you know, matrix multiplication is pretty costly. So, you know, nice-ish solution in principle, but in theory, maybe not, you know, the right thing for the job. If A is diagonalizable, so we'll talk about what diagonalizability is in a second, but if it is diagonalizable, then I claim that we can actually avoid calculating A to the K completely. Um, and we'll see what I mean by that in the coming slides. But to go over one last way, um, if I've actually got um, my matrix A, and I can write it as B plus C for two other matrices B and C, such that they commute, so their product commutes, I can write it as BC or CB, so I can multiply them in either order I like, then I can just split a bit like this. So it's a result, you don't prove it, but it's a result that if I've got the matrix exponential of a product of matrices, that's just the product of the individual matrix exponentials. So if that's the case, I can write e to the a is equal to e to the b, e to the c. Um, this is where you need the commutativity assumption, just to prove that. Um, so we don't really do anything with it other than that, but you know, it's necessary so that you can say this. If you have this kind of representation of your matrix A, then if I just go and find what the exponential of these two things are, then I'm done, right? Because then I can just take their matrix product and I'm done. Problem is, a, it's a bit hard to actually figure out what B and C should be. And two, it's a problem then to actually say, okay, well, are E to the B and E to the C actually any easier to calculate um, the exponential of than just this? If you get really lucky, the answer is yes, but um, in general, probably not gonna work. So perhaps it's worth looking at the second method I prescribed. Um, what happens if we have a diagonalizable matrix? <clears throat> we can actually just completely skip evaluating any of those matrix powers. So what is diagonalizability? Um, this is something that you hopefully would have seen back in first year. Um, if not, now is definitely the time to remember what it is. So if I have an n by n complex matrix A, this is said to be diagonalizable. If there is a non-singular, by which I mean, you know, the determinant of Q is not zero. So it's got an inverse. Non-singular n by n complex matrix Q, such that if I take this three-way matrix product, Q inverse AQ, so if I conjugate A by Q, if this matrix is diagonal, I, it looks something a bit like this, where I've got, you know, zeros everywhere else, except along the same, um, on the primary diagonal, then this matrix here is diagonalizable. Now, the major theorem that you've got here, the spectral theorem, is that an n by n complex matrix A is diagonalizable precisely when, so if and only if, there exists an eigenbasis for Cn of eigenvectors, by which I mean, um, you know, you've got n linearly independent eigenvectors. Moreover, if this is the case, I can actually tell uh, a little bit more about what this diagonal matrix is and also what this Q matrix is. So moreover, capital lambda here uh, are diagonal matrix Q inverse AQ. This Q matrix here, all of the columns are just the eigenvectors in a specific order. So one, two, blah, 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 all the way up to N. Um, and our diagonal matrix is then just gonna be um, the diagonal matrix whose entries, whose entries, I should say, are the um, eigenvalues. 
And this order here, v1, v2, blah, 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 all the way up to vn, has to match the order of the eigenvalues. So you can't have, um, in the two by two case, you can't have v1, v2, and then your capital lambda be um, lambda two, lambda one. That doesn't work. You've got to have the same subscripts. So lambda i is the eigenvalue corresponding to eigenvector vi. So why is that helpful? How does this help us actually calculate the matrix exponential? Well, the problem with matrix exponentials is obviously we've got to calculate these things. Um, so really what the diagonalization gives us is a way to efficiently um, work with these. So if I've got a to the k, well, I know that I've got k copies of a in this product. Each of them can be written like this. So you know, capital lambda is q inverse a q. Um, if I was to rearrange for a, I'd get q lambda q inverse. So I can write that k times. And now I can notice that these adjacent q inverse q's, they cancel out, because obviously if I multiply a matrix by its inverse, I just get the identity back. Um, similarly, all of these adjacent pairs of q inverse and q are going to cancel. Uh, the only ones which don't are the ones on the far left and the far right. Uh, and all we're left with is basically just a bunch of lambdas next to each other. We'll have exactly k of them. Um, so we'll end up with lambda to the power of k in the middle. Um, so, you know, we've reduced calculating one matrix power and decalculating another matrix power. Does that help us? Well, it actually does in this case because um, it turns out that finding lambda to the k is actually not that hard. Um, you basically just take all of the eigenvalues along the primary diagonal and you raise them to the power of k. So doing it like this, we don't actually really have to calculate very many matrix products at all. We only have to evaluate this one here. So to cut to the chase, sort of where we need to be, if A has diagonalization Q lambda Q inverse, then E to the A is exactly going to be equal to Q E to the lambda Q inverse. And E to the lambda, this thing in the middle of this um, you know, matrix sandwich, is going to be exactly kind of what you think it is. It's going to be the diagonal matrix where you've got all of the eigenvalues and you just exponentiate them. Now, obviously, when we were looking at our theorem, we were looking at e to the ta instead of e to the a, but this doesn't really change anything. Um, if you want to be more you know, pedantic about the exact formula that we're going to need, this is what you get. So the upshot here is that if you can diagonalize, you can exponentiate matrices quite well. Um, now, you know, obviously, this works if you're lucky to have such a diagonalization. If you don't, ooh, you're in a bit of trouble. But in this course, they don't ever really touch on that case. So you don't actually really have to worry about that. You can pretty much take it as a granted every time that you're working with such a system that you've got, um, you know, you can diagonalize it. Moving on to something completely separate, we have now equilibrium points. So this is sort of a zero of your vector field. So if you're working with some, um, you know, dynamical system governed by this equation here with this vector field. So this vector field determines our equation. Um, an equilibrium point is any point at which this is the zero vector. Um, in this case, if I've got an equilibrium point of this system here, then I actually get something rather nice. The solution to this initial valued system is actually just the constant function. So it's the constant vector valued function x of t is equal to a. Uh, which is quite surprising. So if you have something that looks a bit like this, then your system is really not that interesting. Uh, equilibrium points have their own properties. We're going to spend most of the rest of the um, seminar talking about some of them. So we have stable equilibria. So an equilibrium point is stable if, you know, there's a bunch of epsilon delta stuff here. I'm not going to read it. Um, you can in your own time once you've got the slides, but um, the intuition for this is that a solution starts close enough to some stable equilibrium point, then they're going to remain close to this stable equilibrium point. Where, you know, remaining close and all of that's formalized within um, this epsilon delta stuff that you've got uh, up on the screen. 
uh, if I skip to the last definition, I'm absolutely going to skip um, reading out all the itty gritty details of this one. So this is a stronger form of stability um, on a subset of Rn, um, asymptotic stability. Again, not going to go into it just because it's a little bit, um, you know, nitty gritty. But the intuition here is that if you have an asymptotically stable um, mind blank equilibrium point, then not only do the solutions stay close to this stable equilibrium point, they also approach it as t goes to infinity. Um, so you have this notion of a domain of attraction. Well, the idea of attraction here is that, you know, solutions to this system are actually going to get attracted to this um, equilibrium point as time goes to infinity. So let's have a look again at a dumbed down version of this in the linear constant case. So this time we're not quite disregarding this B yet. Um, if I've got something like this, then you know, if you go and solve this, obviously you want to find, you know, for what values of x is ax um, plus b equal to zero, you should be able to quite easily see, assuming that a is non-singular, of course, that the only equilibrium point you get is negative a inverse b. So if you take that matrix vector product, negate it, that's the only equilibrium point of this system. Um, and then moreover, I can actually write the solution to that system in this way. So I've got um, equilibrium point plus e to the ta of the difference between um, your initial state vector and the um, equilibrium point. So the reason that I skipped a lot of the more technical definitions of stability and asymptotic stability is because there is a really nice way to check this in the linear constant case. Um, if I've got a linear coefficient system like this, then this unique equilibrium point that we've just said is unique is going to be stable if and only if all of the eigenvalues of this matrix A have non-positive real part. So they're either zero or they're less than zero. And they're going to be asymptotically stable if this is a strict inequality. So if you don't have it equal to zero, then this is going to be um, asymptotically stable. And in fact, here, the domain of attraction is going to be Rn. Again, have a look at the previous slides, because um, I haven't really talked about, you know, this asymptotic stability very much. Uh, and obviously, if it's neither, we're going to call it unstable. So, you know, the, the goal here is that if I've got all of my, um, well, if I even have some eigenvalue that has positive real part, then it's unstable, right? So how about we look at classifying some of these 2D linear systems? So if I've got some linear system where now I've just sort of disregarded the constant vector, um, again, assuming this A is non-singular, just because it you know, makes all of the math quite a bit easier, um, the general solution to this will be one of two things. So we do have to be a little bit careful about whether these eigenvalues that we get for this non-singular matrix are going to be um, real or complex. So if they're real, and we assume for now at least that they're different, so lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2, um, and they have linearly independent eigenvectors, then this is going to be my general solution. So for some constants c1, c2, yet to be determined, um, it's going to be some linear combination of e to the lambda 1t, scaling the vector v1, um, plus e to the lambda 2t times the vector v2. Uh, if my eigenvalues are the same thing, then you know, I can just write it like this instead. Um, but if my eigenvalues are complex conjugates, so if I've got, you know, lambda 1 is alpha plus you know, i beta, well, lambda 2 is going to be equal to lambda 1 conjugate in this case, then my general solution is actually going to be a little bit different. So here, and I want you to pay close attention to the subscripts that we've got here, this is going to be, for some constant c1, c2, yet to be determined, um, this is going to be c1 plus the real part of this vector, plus c2 plus the imaginary part of the same vector. So the thing in the parentheses here is the exact same, 
right? It's the exact same term. Um, we're just taking real parts and imaginary parts separately. Now, obviously, because we've disregarded the vector B, well, we know from earlier that A inverse B is going to be the um, unique um, equilibrium point of this system. Well, B here is zero, so um, really we're working with the equilibrium point A is equal to zero. Um, we can now say a couple more things about its stability. So we can give a little bit more of a classification of these equilibria. If I am in the case where my eigenvalues are different, so, you know, without loss of generality, one is less than the other, um, but in this case they're both less than zero, then I've got something that looks a bit like this. So if I want to draw this phase plot, I start by drawing lines representing the eigenvectors v1 and v2 in the plane. So here is my um, eigenvector 1, 1, and somewhere here, I suppose this one is going to be my um, eigenvector 2, 1. So if I draw those in the plane, then construct trajectories starting far out from the equilibrium point, so kind of just, you know, on the edges of this plot here, they're going to start close to the direction of this, um, you know, first line that I've got here, 1, 1 but they're going to approach V2 as it gets sucked into the equilibrium point. So what I mean by that is, if I get rid of all my drawings, you know, I've got this line here. It's obviously going to go to the equilibrium point because we know here that this, you know, because they're less than zero, this is going to be a um, asymptotically stable um, equilibrium point. They get pulled in, but they sort of start approaching this more steep eigenvector here, right? So they're all going to sort of do that, but ultimately they're going into the center. Um, and just an example of, you know, a setup, if we go solve this system, um, we find out that the eigenvectors and eigenvalues are like this, then our solution is going to have this form. Conversely, if I have another way where, again, if they're non-equal eigenvalues, then I can say one is bigger than the other. If they're both positive in this case, then I have something called an unstable node. So it's certainly not stable because um, I didn't have my, um, you know, I had negative eigenvectors here. Now I've got positive things, so that's not in the definition. So now they're, you know, it's an unstable node. Things are going to get repelled away from the equilibrium point. It's basically the same process though. I draw eigenvectors in the plane corresponding to these draw some that start, you know, kind of out here, away from the equilibrium point. They're going to stay close to the eigenvector of the smaller eigenvalue, but as they approach the, um, you know, as they go out, they're going to start approaching the direction of the um, more dominant eigenvalue. So the direction of that eigenvector they're going to approach, and obviously everything, because it's unstable, is going to be pointing outwards. So everything points away from this um, origin here. And again, not going to go into it too much, but if you've got a setup, this is sort of what your general solution would end up looking like. If you have two equal eigenvalues, and they're both not zero, then you actually have something called an unstable star. So all non-zero vectors are eigenvectors in this case for our system, and as such, all trajectories are either going to be attracted or repelled by the equilibrium points in a straight line. Um, and the way that this attraction or repulsion works is that if your um, equal eigenvalues are both negative, you've got inward attraction, but if they're positive, you've got outward repulsion. In this case, we can see by the plot that we've actually got outward repulsion. So in this case, the eigenvalues would be equal but positive. If I have, I guess my last case to consider is if I've got lambda 1 and lambda 2, um, which one's positive, one's negative, then I have something called a saddle node. Now, in this case, they're going to be unstable. So, again, do the same thing where I draw eigenvectors in the plane corresponding to my two you know, eigenvectors. Um, obviously, along the eigenvectors, they're going to be straight lines. Those on V1 are going to be attracted towards the equilibrium point. So on the smaller of the um, eigendirections, so the one that corresponds to the negative eigenvalue, we know that that's going to be um, that's going to be stable, that part at least. So they're going to get pulled in 
close to the um, equilibrium point. But those that are following the more dominant positive one, obviously that's you know, positive, so they're going to be unstable. They're going to be going away. And then you can draw all other trajectories starting close to V1, kind of approaching, but then getting, you know, pulled away and also approaching the more dominant eigendirection. And again, if you have this pair of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, you get this general solution, just as an example. Um, that's all of the real numbers that you have to worry about. If you have complex eigenvalues, then I guess one case you have is if they're purely imaginary. So if they're, you know, 3i, negative 3i, something like that, what you actually get is something called a center. If the eigenvalues are purely imaginary, then these trajectories are going to form orbits around the equilibrium point. Uh, the reason for that is because if you go back to the general solution, you're going to have like, you know, e to the it um, v1, something like this. I can write this as just, you know, cosine t plus i sine t, um, you know, times my vector v1, v2. And then I can just go and identify um, the real and imaginary parts of this. But because I've got these trig functions here, we know that they're sort of related to the circle. So it's there's no great surprise that um, what you end up with is something that looks like a circle when you actually plot it out. Um, so they're going to orbit the origin here, the equilibrium point. The direction in which they do that, so is it going to be clockwise or counterclockwise? The way you do that is you test the um, value of this derivative at a point. So positive, it's going to go clockwise, I think. And if it's negative, it's going to go anti-clockwise. The other case is where you have non-negligible uh, real part. So these are, you know, mixed complex functions, uh, eigenvalues, I should say, but they're ultimately complex conjugates of one another. This is going to form a spiral. So it's going to look like this spiral shape. It's going to spiral inward. So it's going to sort of be stable um, when the real part is less than zero. That much we sort of already expect. And similarly, when it's a positive real part, it's going to spiral outward. Uh, we can see here that because everything's sort of going in, uh, we've probably got a negative real part for this particular plot. Uh, and once again, if you want to actually find the way in which it goes, whether it's a clockwise or anti-clockwise spiral, you test the value of dx dt at a point. So let's have a look at an example, just to tie in some of the stuff that we've been doing. Consider the following linear system of equations. So dx dt is equal to x plus 2y, and dy dt is negative 5x minus y. First, we want to find the general solution to the above system of equations. And then we want to say something about what the equilibrium point zero, zero is going to look like. Or what properties does it have? You know, what's its nature? What's its stability? As a start, because we have just formulated all of this in terms of matrices, it's probably prudent to start by turning it into a matrix. So if I just read off all of the coefficients here, one, two, five, uh, negative one, chuck those into a matrix. This is really just multiplying the vector x, y. So if I do this, I have, you know, honest to goodness, got the same um, system as I got here. Just now I've expressed it as a matrix. So I now need to go and find for this matrix A here, well, I need to go and find what the um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. So Again, this is something that I'm hoping that you would have seen first year, but if you've got a two by two matrix, you know, A, B, C, D, I'm not quite sure my computer's so slow now. Um, hopefully this isn't ruining the stream. Um, then a way that I can do this, calculate what the eigenvalues are first, is I know that the sum of these is going to be um, what's on the primary diagonal. So it's going to be a plus d here. It's going to be the trace of the matrix. And the product of the eigenvalues is actually going to be the determinant of the matrix. Now, if you go all the way back and you think about it, well, um, we know automatically just by looking at this that the trace is going to be 0, because 1 plus negative 1 is 0. Um, the determinant, you know, you can calculate that. That's going to be negative 1 minus the product of these things on the off diagonal. Um, that's going to be negative 10. So we're going to get negative 1 
plus 10, which is 9. So our two eigenvalues satisfy that their sum is 0 and their product is 9. Now you can go off and solve that. It's not too hard, hopefully. But once you do, you'll end up with the fact that they are going to be um, complex conjugates, purely imaginary eigenvalues. So at this point, we can almost already tell what our um, equilibrium point's nature is going to be, just based on this. Um, but we haven't yet solved the system. Now, when I've got complex eigenvalues, finding the associated eigenvectors is often quite a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, I will show a nice trick for calculating that in this case that doesn't take very long at all. Um, obviously, if I've got some eigenvector v, then um, that's going to satisfy this equation sort of by definition. So this is what your um, eigenvector does. If I take a, subtract from it the multiple of the identity matrix that corresponds to our eigenvector, eigenvalue I should say, this is going to be exactly the zero matrix. Put another way, that's what I've got. So if I turn this into an actual matrix, then um, this is what I'm left with. Now, what I can do is, well, if this is equal to zero, then it certainly must be the case that if I expand this out, I have that um, 1 minus 3i times whatever the first component of v is, plus 2 times whatever the second component of v is, that has to be zero. Because this is, you know, that's, that's what it means for this product to be zero. You can't have a non-zero component somehow be equal to the zero vector. So if I just multiply out this first row here with this thing here, so if I take the dot product of this first row with v, this is going to be zero. So this is enough to give me a relationship between the um, components of this vector v here. If I go and isolate one of them onto the other side, so let's say I'm going to pick v2, just because if I divide by complex numbers, that's a bit messy, because you know then I'll have to realize the denominator, and you know I don't really want that. So instead, I'll pick out v2 as the thing to find in terms of v1. Well, obviously I need to take this to the other side, so I flip the signs of this 1 minus 3i bit, and then I divide by 2. And if I do that, I get that v2 is equal to negative 1 plus 3i on 2 times v1. Now this is enough to write my vector as um, v1 negative 1 plus 3i on 2 times v1. But if I was to take v1 out the front, then I've got 1 negative 1 plus 3i on 2 times some constant v1. But what do we know about eigenvectors? If I have any eigenvector v, then 2v, 3v, half v, a million v, blah, 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 whatever, these are all also eigenvectors. So it doesn't actually matter whether I take double my eigenvector, half my eigenvector, whatever, still an eigenvector. In particular, I can disregard this constant of v1 out the front. And if I multiply everything by 2, just so that I don't have this denominator fraction creeping about, what I've got here, this thing that I've bolded in red, is actually going to be an eigenvector. So I can just take this and sort of forget that this v1 part exists, and this here will be my eigenvector. So now, as we learned back a couple slides, the formula, when you've got eigenvalues like this, is that you want to take the real part of this um, scaled vector and then take the imaginary part of this same vector and then you just sum them together, slap some undetermined constants in and you're done. Now I won't go through the derivation of what the real and imaginary parts here are, um, but the way you do it is you just use this identity here, Euler's identity, um, and this should very naturally fall out once you take things, um, group things by you know, whether they're real or imaginary in the vector. And you end up with something that looks like this. Now, as I was saying before, after we found out that the eigenvalues were purely imaginary and also complex conjugates of one another, um, we were almost really immediately able to say what the nature of it was. Well, real part is zero, so it's going to be stable. Um, and we saw when we were looking at the nice pictures before that if we have something like this, we get something called a center. So it's going to be a stable center. 
and that's enough to finish off the question. Last thing I'll cover before we finish off for this first part of the seminar is this notion of first integrals. Now this will only really be relevant if you're in triple two one. So if you're in two one two one, you don't need to worry about this. Um, but if you're in triple two one, we'll talk about this quickly. Um, Nonlinear problems. So the genesis of this concept is that nonlinear problems are much harder to solve. Like you know, you give someone just one nonlinear ordinary differential equation, and it's hard enough. Um, let alone a system that's nonlinear, right? Because we've been focusing on the linear case quite a lot. Um, we haven't really touched on what happens in the nonlinear case, uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because it's really hard. But one really basic idea that I've got. Um, called a first integral allows us to give some sort of solution to some of these, right? So what is a first integral? If I have a function capital G from R into R, so this is just a regular mathematical function now, it just takes a um, vector as an output and a vector as an input, I should say, and it gives a real number back as an output. So I'm not working with vector fields anymore. It's going to be a first integral of this autonomous system of nonlinear ODEs if along any solution trajectory xt this function here is constant. So if for every solution x of this we have g of x is equal to some fixed constant c, fixed constant, for every solution then this is called a first integral. Um, there is some geometric intuition for this um, G is a first integral, I guess, if um, G and F are, you know, the gradient of G is perpendicular to this vector field F at every point. You know, so if you draw your um, you know, vector field in the plane, that's pretty terrible, but your function G here is going to be perpendicular to this at every point. Right? Apologies for the siren if you hear that in the background, but yes. G is a first integral if and only if the gradient of this G function is perpendicular to the vector field at every point. So to finish off, we'll talk about um, an example. I came up with this. I didn't lift it from a past paper or anything. Um, it's quite an unconventional question in the context of like what sort of things you get asked in triple two one, because um, most of the time you're given a first integral function, so a candidate for a first integral, and asked to verify that it is uh, a first integral. In this case, I've given this question, it's you know, a relatively simple system, but I want to actually find a first integral. So I'm not given it, I want to find what it is. Um, and I want to then compute my answer by checking that these things truly are um, perpendicular at every point x, because I want to show that this here is actually zero for every x. How the heck do we actually go about doing this? Because you haven't learned any methods for this. So obviously, if you uh, posed this question in the exam, they would have to give you some sort of hint. The hint here is to find dy dx first. So remember that dx dt, this vector thing here, is really just going to be, well, it's going to be, I guess I should write it in order. It's going to be dx dt dy dt, right? That's really what this vector is. It's just a vector of component-wise derivatives. So if I find what dy dx is first, then I can do something, solve that equation, and end up with um, somehow this first integral g. How do I do that? Well, again, dy dx, I can sort of suspend our disbelief at the fact that this is really just a fraction. Um, do a trick that we've probably seen a couple times now, which is that if I've got a fraction like this, I can sort of reverse the chain rule on it um, to where I can now say that this is dy dt times dt dx. Now I know how to work with these because this is sort of what our vector says, right? So as before, it's, you know, first component's dx dt, second component is dy dt. I can then read that off from this, you know, vector field f that I'm given here. So dx dt is exactly this guy, uh, and dy dt is exactly this guy. So if I go and do that, this bit here is my dy dt. And this denominator here, this 1 over x, 1 minus y bit, is my um, 
dt dx, which is again just dx dt on one, inverse, whatever. Um, and for that, I just flip it, obviously. Now, if I do this, then if I separate things, so you can probably tell where this is going because I'm looking at a separable equation now. I've gone and separated it so I've only got y's on one side and only got x's on one side. So this equation is a separable ODE. We know how to solve those now. So if I go and do that and integrate both sides, well, if I integrate this, I get, well, for the first time I get log of the absolute value of y minus y. And here I'm going to get x minus the absolute value of log x plus some classic constant of integration c. Now, if I use my log laws and collect things so that I've only got you know x and y's on one side and I've only got my constant on the other, I get log of the absolute value of xy minus x plus y is equal to c. And if then I go and exponentiate things, um, I'm able to drop the absolute values I'll leave you to think about why that is, but I can drop the absolute values once I'm exponentiating. Um, what I end up with is that xy times e to the negative x minus y is equal to some new constant c, right? So this is still a constant, it's just, you know, I've done something like exponentiated the little c and now I've got, you know, big c, whatever. So think about what we're looking for, we're looking for a first integral, I've now got this function here that is equal to this capital C, provided that I'm working with solutions x and y. So provided that x, boldface, x, y, is a solution to the system that I was looking at, this ends up being a constant. So if I just phrase this in another way, this is just saying that this function I've got here is actually a first integral for the system. So if I take this left-hand side of this equation that I've teased out by solving that equation, um, then I have a first integral. And now is the last thing that we might want to check. We might want to say, okay, um, is this dot product equal to zero? You can go through it. I'm sure I don't have to walk through this with you, but if you go through it, you'll actually see that yes, indeed, this is actually zero. So, you know, having this on its own was enough to conclude that it was a first integral, but just as a nice sanity check, just to make sure that we haven't messed up anything, um, it's reassuring that we do have a zero dot product as well. So these things really are orthogonal. And that's it. So thank you all for coming. Um, for the people that are sticking around live, we're sorry that this went over time. I tried to do my part quite quickly in compensation for that, um, just because a lot of you are going to be watching this back on recording. Um, if you're still here live or watching it after, then please scan this QR code and fill out the linked feedback form that you get after you scan it to give some feedback on how this um, revision seminar went. Uh, but if that's it, then I'll be signing off. Um, tune in tomorrow, same time, for part two of the seminar. So this was the first half of the course. Uh, obviously, there's another half we still have to do. Um, I will be taking some of that as well. Um, but we'll also have Steve, another one of our MathSoc Edu members, taking uh, the other bits that I don't cover. So until then, thank you for watching.